Thank you, Bob. Good evening, and welcome to this meeting of the Hoffington Board of Selectmen for March 5th, 2019. We will begin our meeting with a Pledge of Allegiance. Do I have any scouts in the neighborhood? No. Okay. All rise, please. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, liberty, and justice for all. And um, we will start with our public forum for where um, members of the public are invited to share their ideas, comments, or ask questions regarding town government. Is there anyone who'd like to speak? Please come up to the mic. Shy group. <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah, you got a real shy group here tonight. <laughs> <I can> tell. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, seeing none, um, we will start off with our Hopkinton 101 event. And I see Heather <laughs> Bachman is here. Heather Bachman and Jesse McCarthy of the Hopkinton Public Library will announce this year's Hopkinton 101, 101 event planned for March 30th, 2019. Good evening, Heather. Good Tell evening. I'm, I'm actually not really talking tonight. I'm going to introduce you to Jesse McCarthy, Jessie. our adult services librarian, and let her talk to you. So we started Hopkinton 101 last year. This will be our second one, March 30th from 10 to 2. Um, it's basically a community fair style event with different board members and organizations, nonprofit organizations come in. And it's a chance for everyone to meet each other and socialize and see what kind of services are offered in town. So it was really successful last year. And we hope to keep growing it and building it. Certainly, if, if the Board of Selectmen uh, yes. have the opportunity to drop in. I think, I think Mr. Coutinho, you were there last yeah. year, at least, mm. right? Um, it was a really great event for the community and both the groups that were there and the residents that stopped in. We'd love to see you again. I heard great things about it. I stopped in. The place was jumping. I think you said to us now it's not going to be big. You're not going to be able to contain it in the one room. You're going to have to oh, have it throughout. Um, if groups want to participate or have a spot or a table, do they need, they need to register with you ahead of time? How does that work? Yep. Just email me and we'll set it up. And are you looking um, also for town government or primarily um, various citizen groups through town? <laughs> Both, uh, both nonprofits, yeah. but we also have um, Connors to be there with some information about annual meeting and things like that. So, mm -hmm. and okay. I know Sean Board of Health was there last yeah. year. A number of the, the committees came. So, so have you um, sent notices to the various boards and committees encouraging them? The various. Yeah, yeah. We have. we've invited yeah. them all. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Good. All right. So you're the contact. Uh, Jesse's the contact, contact. person with the yeah. email. If you want to participate, and um, what's your deadline? Uh. Probably about a week before. Week before. Yeah. We can move pretty fast, so. <laughs> we'll do what we can. If yeah. anybody wants to come, we'll try and make it work. Great. Yeah. Well, I'm sure it's going to be a great event because you sure, uh, sure did a good job last year. So. Yep. Great. Well, thanks for coming and telling us and announcing it so everybody at home can see and be on the lookout and certainly Richard. make sure you get there. Very fun. Quick question. Where, was, where will this be held? It will be at the library, um, probably all three floors. We uh, are going to have some of the kids' focused organizations uh, upstairs in the children's room, mm -hmm. um, a lot in that main large event room and spilling out probably into the lobby a little bit, <laughs> um, and then some groups downstairs in the lower level as well. Fantastic. So they, we take over the whole library for the day. <laughs> <laughs> And the hours? Work in the library. Yeah. <laughs> if you have quiet study rooms, though, yes. if you do need quiet spots. <laughs> what are the hours? 10 to 2. 10 to 2. Okay. And that's on March 30th? Yes. Saturday. Excellent. Thank you very much. Thank and you. Thanks Thank for coming you. to us. Yes. Okay, great. All right. And we are very happy to have the next agenda item. This is the Deputy Police Chief Ceremony. And the Board of Selectmen will formally accept Police Chief Edward Lee's recommendation to promote <laughs> Lieutenant Joseph Bennett as Hopkinton Deputy Police Chief, effective March 5th, that's today, 2019. Come on up. Chief.
Chief and Deputy Chief. <laughs> Welcome. Well, it's my pleasure to present uh, Lieutenant Bennett for the position of Deputy Chief with uh, your permission. <laughs> I'll start off with a little bio uh, about the career of Lieutenant Bennett, who came to us uh, in 1993 after serving in Southborough and Sutton Police Department. He has served in patrol detectives and held the rank of sergeant for 16 years. As sergeant, Lieutenant Bennett, who is in charge of detectives, communications, corp prosecutor, school resource officer program. Currently, Lieutenant Bennett is second in command at the Hopkinton Police Department. He oversees budget, records, professional standards, including internal affairs and training. Internal affairs, not the best job. Okay. <laughs> 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 Lieutenant Bennett continues to serve as the uh, grant administrator and has been successfully awarded over $1 million in grant funds. These funding opportunities have brought funding for equipment, training, overtime, and hiring personnel. Most notably, the school resource officer program was created using federal funds for hiring of two police officers to backfill, backfill assignments of the new SROs. Lieutenant Bennett was instrumental in the creation and the consolidation of the public safety dispatch and worked on all facets of the information, including hiring, training, and policy development. Lieutenant Bennett is a member of the Boston Marathon Executive Planning Team. He is prim his primary responsibility for the security plan and deployment of internal and external sources. This collaboration brings over 900 police officers from over 60 agencies, including seven states and several federal agencies. While assigned as a detective, Lieutenant uh, Bennett received recognition from the Massachusetts House of Representatives for his work in the Tri-County Drug Force, and he has also been recognized by Mothers Against Drunk Drivers for his work in preventing drunk driving. In 2009, Lieutenant Bennett received the Hopkinton Police Materia Service Award for his actions, when a man armed with a knife attempted to stab him, the man was taken into custody without any serious injuries to the suspect or uh, to other officers. Ted Bennett holds a master's degree in criminal justice administration from Western New England University and has received high level training, including attending the Roger Williams University management course and has received the FBI law enforcement. Executive Director Association Trilogy Award. Lieutenant De Bennett is dedicated professional with his proven leadership, interpersonal and communication skills. He is creative and continues to bring creative ideas to fruition through teamwork and results based on leadership. He has an extensive track record of progressive responsibility, accumulated accomplishments resulting in the improved departmental effectiveness, enhanced quality, of life for the community. Excellent. Joe, you've been so much a part of this community for so long. This is really, really nice to see. Thank you, Madam Chair. I, I'm kind of at a loss of words. I'm a little overwhelmed by it. Um, it's truly humbling. I, uh, I know I couldn't have made or accomplished half of what I have without the blessing of the people that I've been surrounded by in the department and in my personal life, the strong leadership, uh, the commitment that my chiefs have shown, including Chief Lee, and uh, of course, uh, my wife, who suffered through 18 years of nights and uh, being, home, being home with children and trying to keep them quiet while I was sleeping, and uh, I just can't say thank you enough to everybody. And I... Uh, Look forward to this opportunity and the new challenges that, that it brings. And I'm very grateful for the opportunity. Board members, comments, questions for Joe? Well, Chief, Deputy Chief, I like that sound of that. Um, I don't know if you remember back in 1993 when you started, but you and I spent about a month together uh, on the Oakhurst Road sewer detail. I was on the other side of the construction. Uh, you were on the right side. If there was a problem, I had to stay. You could go. Um, I had. I was, I was very lucky to be able to to get to know you very well back then. Um, you have been a shining star 
in this town since 1993. Uh, I know because I've been in this town since 1993, uh, long before that. So we, as a community, are lucky to have someone of your caliber uh, on the police force, whether it be a, an officer, a sergeant, lieutenant, deputy chief, whatever. We're, we're lucky to have you. Um, the mark of a good leader is always someone that deflects the praise to the people that he works for, and that was the first thing out of your mouth. So um, you're right, you wouldn't be who you are without the people that surround you, but don't give them 50% of the credit. <laughs> I'll give them 10. <laughs> you bring them up. Uh, I look in the audience today, I see a lot of the guys on the force that I've known since they got on, some before that. Um, they're all better police officers because of your tutelage, your patience, and your leadership. Um, as a selectman, <clears throat> this is one of the reasons that you run for selectman, because we get to actually do something that's great for the community. Not good, great for the community. You are, as I said, a shining star. I had to send you a text after our last meeting when we discussed you to make sure I didn't offend you when I said that you were disgustingly smart. Um, <clears throat> and anybody who who disagrees with the fact that you're disgustingly <laughs> smart doesn't know you. So um, from the bottom of my heart, congratulations. Thank you very much for sticking with us for as long as you have. We're looking forward for another 20 years of you uh, uh, not working nights. So thank you for, <laughs> thank you for seeing them through. Um, but congratulations, and uh, we're very lucky to have you. And Chief Lee, thank you very much for the, for the, uh, for the words for him. He certainly earned it. Thank you. Congratulations, really, it's, uh, it's, it's well-deserved. Chief, yeah. very good, thank you for doing this. You know, you, know you, you really epitomize everything we're looking for in a police officer here in Hopkinton, you know, from, from great community policing and, and, and being, a, being a, if I can say, a cop that everybody knows and everybody um, appreciates and respects to somebody that can just like w with the knife incident that could turn it on in an instant and, and go right into personal protection. And, you know, that, and, that's, that, and that's what um, what every small town's looking for. Um, and um, it's, uh, I think it's a great choice. I'm, I'm, I'm really pleased to see this, to this, see this happening. But what's this mean? You don't have to work nights now? Let's see, golf. Let's still up in the air. <laughs> Oh, all right. But anyway, really, congratulations. Thank you very much. I think it was a, a great pick, Chief. Thank you. Thank you. Congratulations. Um, I don't know what else I can say from what's already been said. Uh, but, of course, I can dig something up. <laughs> Quite a little you know? <laughs> the art of babble. No. Um, you know, I think what, what truly makes our, our force great is the involvement in the community, and I think you've demonstrated that. For the, you know, since '93, um, and the, the various initiatives that you've taken on, um, the safety initiative, the school initiatives. I've told Chief Lee how much I was impressed with the uh, school resource officer, uh, that whole project, and how well it's worked. Uh, for my kids to be able to feel comfortable to reach out to a cop, I think is 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 a big step, um, and I think that's uh, that's really the relationship that we want between the citizenry and our and our officers. So, I love what you've done, and um, I'm glad to see that you're sticking around and moving on up. Thank you. And one of the disadvantages to going last is... <laughs> <laughs> but it, it's thunder. not hard to find new ground to cover with you, Joe, quite honestly. Um, you know, for the years I've known you, you just, to me, are the full expression of, of strength, of professionalism, of approachability, of... Um, talent of all the qualities that a police department in either a large or a small community wants to have and how many um, other communities would love to have this kind of a resource that you that you represent to us and you know <clears throat> we said many times here too doesn't matter if you're a small community a large community a quiet town I mean you read the police reports and maybe it's you know somebody getting help out of the snow or it's somebody and it's a possum in the basement but then the next minute it can be you know someone with a knife 
I watched out my window a couple months ago and there was a whole SWAT team that came up to a, to a house on, on Hayden Row or, you know, an attempted murder. And you have to be ready and you have to be trained for that. And, you know, you and our force knows how to respond to each of those situations and turn on a dime and I think have always responded with the utmost degree of professionalism. And when you see what goes on today and the scrutiny that police departments and policemen are under, um, what a value to have a force that we really can feel confident in, in and, and proud of. And, um, you know, Wendy, <laughs> all your years, now you got the little ones here. Uh, but it's, it's just so nice. Um, to know that we have you as part of our of our town family because you've meant so much to us. And I also want to just compliment and thank Chief Lee for the smooth transition, for working this through and making this all work. Um, we're all a stronger, better community because of it and for both of you. So congratulations. And uh, I don't know, that, is there a pinning? Has this been done? Are we... Do you have a new number now? <laughs> and what do we call you? Lieutenant Bennett kind of rolled off the tongue. We're Deputy Chief Bennett, I guess. That's a joke, huh? Madam Chair, I would be happy for you to call me Joe. <laughs> well, I do know, I see on the agenda that it speaks of the selectmen formally appointing or accepting police chief's recommendations. So perhaps we should have so a motion. I'll, I'll make a motion to uh, accept... Uh, Chief Lee's recommendation to promote Lieutenant Joseph Bennett as Hopkinton's Deputy Police Chief, effective March 5th, 2019. I will proudly second that. That has been moved and seconded. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 And opposed, that is unanimous and heartily so. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
consent agenda and there are three articles the first is the board minutes the board of selectmen will consider approving the february 26 2019 board of selectmen minutes <coughs> item two parade permit dms esports for the jimmy fund walk approval of this parade permit application from aaron <coughs> went Nemzer, on behalf of DMS Esports, would permit the 31st Annual Boston Marathon Jimmy Fun Walk on Sunday, September 22, 2019, beginning at the Marathon Start Line, Main Street, Hopkinton, and ending at Main Street, Route 135, at the Ashland Town Line. There will be a conned lane along the route where there is no sidewalk. No full road closures are being requested. Permitting team recommends approval and report that previous events have been successful. And item three is also a permit parade permit for max performance, 13th annual season of triathlon events at Hopkinton State Park. Request access to town roads. Approval of the parade permit application from Tim Richmond, race director, on behalf of Max Performance, would grant access to town roads for triathlon events to be held on May 11, 2019 and September 8, 2019. No road closures are planned. Only police details will be stationed at key intersections. The bike route will enter Hopkinton Roads from Hopkinton <coughs> State Park. Expected number in attendance is expected to be 600. Permitting team recommends approval and report that previous events have been successful. Um, would anyone like to pull out any of these agenda items for separate discussion? Okay, I would like just a, a word on item two for DM, uh, the Jimmy Fun Walk. So I would request a motion to approve agenda items one, board minutes, and three, parade permit for the 13th annual triathlon. So moved. Second. Moved and seconded to approve items one and three. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. And opposed, that is unanimous. Item two, my only comment, is anyone here from DMSC Sports? Oh, Ron. Real, just really quick, 
because I'm fussy about this litter thing, and I noticed there was a litter control plan, and they said it's acceptable. Um, but the litter control plan simply refers to litter at the start line area. And I just want to make sure that it includes a sweep of the race route as well. Um, it also talked about, you know, that the barrels would be at the gym, at the parking lot, at the structure, but nothing about on the way. So there's a there's a sweep team that, that starts from the middle school where we're going to be hosting all right. of the registration this year to the start line and all the way to all the way down the course. But it will include the entire. OK, course. so that will be covered whether you put a barrel somewhere along the line or not. But there will be a sweep that encompasses more than just the start area. Yes, it does. Sometimes that's where they drop it when they get hot and then they <laughs> drink it. <laughs> exactly. so, okay, that, that was my only caveat and I want to make sure that that got, that got included. Okay. Is there a motion please to ex uh, um, approve the parade permit for DMSE Sports, Jimmy Fund Walk? So moved. Second. Second. Moved and seconded. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 aye and opposed, that is unanimous. Thank, Thank you, you, Ron. Thank you. Now, there's Mr. Kilduff. We have the Sister City proposal for the town of Limassol, Greece. The Board of Selectmen will consider authorizing a letter from the Chair of the Board to the Mayor of Limassol, Cyprus, to initiate discussions regarding the creation of a sister city relationship between the town of Hopkinton and the town of Limassol. And we have Mr. Kilduff here representing the 26.2 Foundation and has done so much on Hopkinton's uh, connections with, with Greece. So tell us quickly what you got and uh, this sounds like a great idea. But I've been told a little, share it with the board. <laughs> it is a good idea. Uh, just by uh, just a little bit of background, um, I have the opportunity to be in front of the Board of Selectmen uh, a fair amount, and uh, I want you to know how much I appreciate that, and I appreciate uh, the, the, the time that uh, you give, the, not just the 26.2 Foundation, but, but me. This, this idea started back in uh, actually 1996. That's the first year. It was the 100th running of the Boston Marathon. In the Board of Selectmen, uh, it was Maureen Duenel and uh, Mary Harrington uh, who were on that board who um, helped us reach out to the BAA, uh, the Boston Athletic Association. And that's when, uh, really, we were, I think, probably the first organization in town to receive any charity numbers. But that goes back to 1996, and it started here. 2006. The selectmen uh, received a letter, I think it was uh, Chairman Clark at that point, uh, from somebody who was interested in putting a sculpture uh, of Kerry Akides in town. Uh, we were able to work that through, uh, and that sculpture, is, as you know, is at mile one. It's the spirit of the marathon. But the Kerry Akides connection is what brings us now to Cyprus. <clears throat> uh, well, Stellianos Kerry Akides was born in Cyprus. Uh, when he was training for the, the 1946 Boston Marathon, he went back to his home uh, from Athens, back to his home in Cyprus, and he trained uh, on the streets in Limassol uh, before he came to Boston and won that. So this community has got uh, a pretty interesting connection based on um, what was one of the most historic Boston Marathons ever ever run and won by, by Kerry Kedis. Uh, so we've got a, a sister city relationship uh, in, in Marathon, Greece. Because now of this connection that uh, this community has with Kyriakides, we've been invited to uh, Limassol to participate in activities uh, around the Limassol Marathon uh, and also to uh, participate in a, uh, in a conference that's really going to focus on his life. Uh, Cyprus is... A, is uh, we don't have a lot of time to go and do a, 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 a ge ge geography and, and a historical importance of, of Cyprus, but that is a very, very critical part of the world at this point. They've, um, they've discovered, um, they think there's a large stash of, of oil off the coast of Cyprus. That's going to become a, a very vibrant uh, part of the world and a critical part of the world. 
but all of this is now coming together, and this, the mayor of Limassol is, is uh, interested in creating a sister city relationship with Hopkinton. We work pretty hard, and we're not bashful about this. Um, immediately when people start talking internationally about sister city relationships, they talk about Boston. And we're pretty aggressive about advancing the idea that it really does all start here in the entry point to the United States for, uh, for places like Lima, so uh, uh, Cyprus in Marathon, Greece ought to be Hopkinton. Uh, so it's starting to expand. Uh, I'm going to be there at the end of the month. It would be uh, in our community's best interest if uh, we could, I could carry with me uh, a letter of introduction and, and an expression of interest on the part of the board to start discussions to create a sister city relationship with Limassol Cyprus. That's it in a nutshell. And I think you also said they've invited you to speak uh, about before a number of the government leaders <coughs> to explain Hopkinson's marathon footprint and why this is a logical and natural connection. And, and I'm sure uh, none of you would be surprised to know um, that we'll take a big part of those, uh, that presentation to talk about Hopkinton uh, and how it fits into the, the global marathon community. Uh, our footprint is, is continuing to expand. Uh, this will be one more leg in terms of that expansion. Board members have questions? It sounds Tim, like I, just, I, yeah, I just want to thank you for, for you know, constantly expanding our marathon for, footprint, bringing it internationally to China, to Europe, to Greece. Yeah, it, it, it's like you said that um, when, I, when people think of the Boston Marathon, I want them to think of Hopkinton. You know, it's always a fun thing when I'm when I'm traveling throughout the world, and 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 I mention the Boston Marathon. I'd say, you know, that uh, I live 26.2 miles outside of outside of Boston, and, it's, and I'm very proud to say that. You know, and and lately with the branding of the first mile, it's you know it, all of this just you know brings recognition to Hopkinton and and um, you know puts us on the map. You know, we are in a great location. But it also just you know, brings it's, it brings us back to the to our vision statement that we're a we're a um, healthy, vibrant, well-educated community, and um, this coupled with uh, you know the the work that you've been doing to try and get this international marathon center going to be the you know, a center uh, a center of endurance sports, mm -hmm. it's just fabulous. So I just really thank you very much for for oh, doing all the work on behalf of Hopkinton. It's easy to do this kind of stuff when you have uh, the boards like the board of selectmen and the support that they've given these, these sort of burgeoning ideas from, from day one. And I, I, I say that, and I'm going to continue to repeat that as well. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's easy. Well, we are delighted. I think we'll probably we'll take a vote on this, I guess. But um, we're very grateful that you've, as John said, taken this initiative. And it sounds like something I would think we'd be pleased to support. Uh, so so what's the can I ask for a motion or well I'd like to say a couple oh, oh please I'm sorry so Tim um, I know that you're squirming up there you hate being in the spotlight the, the amount of work that you do in the background is amazing I've been able to kind of see from from 30,000 feet the work that you do uh, growing up in Hopkinton it used to be cool to see Tim Kilduff on the front you know, no, we knew that you were Bob Lobel's roommate in college, and we knew that, uh, that you were the first guy on the motorcycle talking through the whole marathon. No more secrets, though. That was pretty cool. <laughs> now, Bob Lobel would be the one that would say, it's pretty cool to look at Tim Kilduff. Well, thank you. Uh, you you're a wonderful ambassador uh, for Hopkinton. Uh, the passion that you've had, I mean, we all get passionate about certain things. Uh, for me, th they go in stages. I might like softball, I might like golf, I might like snowmobiling. You're just the marathon. And I don't mean to say just, but you've done, you've carried this level of passion with the marathon since I was just a kid, since I was five, six, seven years old, right through to, I'm just a little older than that now. Um, and it's, it's, it hasn't maintained, it's always increased. And, and I, I just, I can't tell you how, like how, how much I get behind you on the work that you do, because I know that it, this isn't the Tim Kilduff show, it's for Hopkinton, it's for the marathon, it's for Hopkinton, it's for the marathon. It's not for Tim <coughs> Kilduff. You're selfless, you don't like to be in the, in the spotlight. And I love being able to make you squirm right here a little bit, I do. Um, 
but the passion that you bring to the marathon and uh, the level of ambassadorship that you do for, for our town does not uh, fall on deaf ears here. Thank you very much. I just have just a, just a little bit. <laughs> you know, you said that it's easy when you have a supportive board of selectmen. But you see, as a, as a selectman, it's easy to support you. You have that vision. None of, none of these initiatives start without someone coming up with the idea. And then not just only coming up with it, but pursuing it and going after it. That's the tenacity that's, uh, that, that you have and that you brought to this town. And, and I thank you. Um, I'm proud to support you in this endeavor. Excellent. Mr. So, Gino, would you like to make a motion? Madam Chair, I request a motion to send a letter from the Chair of the Board <coughs> to the Mayor of Limassol, Cyprus, to initiate discussions regarding the creation of a sister city relationship between the Town of Hopkinton and the City of Limassol. Actually, I'm requesting that motion. Would you like to make it? Oh, sorry. Yes, I agree. I'd like to make that motion. Good idea. I'll second it. <laughs> <laughs> I guess I'm not yet. <laughs> okay, the motion has been made and seconded. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 And opposed, that is unanimous. Do you have the letter that you'd like me to sign now, or do you want to leave it with the... You know, I, 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 I mean, you're going to be surprised that I don't have one. <laughs> but we'll, we'll do that in the next few days. Get it over and just let me okay. know. We'll get it signed. All right. Thank you very, very much for your time. And thank I appreciate you it. very, very much. Thank, thank you, Tim. So. This is great news. And um, next on our agenda, we have a legislative update, and we are honored to have uh, both state senator and president of the state senate, uh, the Honorable Karen Spilka, here tonight, and also our state representative, Carolyn Dykema. The Board of Selectmen will receive a legislative update from Senate President Karen E. Spilka and Representative Carolyn C. Dykema and the school committee is invited to the meeting. We're pleased that you both could come. Um, I'd like everybody to be able to hear, be in, hear and participate, so I thought maybe um, Representative um, Dykema and uh, President Spilka, if you could maybe sit in these two, and I know I have the school superintendent and four members, so I'm, oh, you better have five. No, yes. We need another chair. I was gonna say, bring one of those threesies forward and we'll have five and you one. Oh, there's no microphone. Okay, then I think we better put you two over here where there's at least a mic. And, thank you for coming. All right, just, just as long as you don't feel um, Carolyn, Karen, why, why don't you sit here because there's a microphone. Um, yeah, because you need to have the mic. I just don't want the school committee to feel left out with your backs, but speak up and... <laughs> yeah. I just want to make sure everybody is included and it's supposed to be a joint meeting, so... We'll do the best we can. <laughs> we can scooch if... <laughs> Welcome, and thank you so much for taking time to come and speak with us tonight from your busy schedule. So I'll be glad to turn it over to you both. Well, thank you. Um, we haven't talked about how we're no, going we to do this. But, uh, <laughs> uh, okay. Um, just legislatively, um, you know, I think all of you know, just for in terms of revenue and local aid and, and Chapter 70, just a real brief overview. And then I may just mention a couple of things that, that I'm focusing on. Um, the Jan through January, actually now through February, today we got the February uh, revenue numbers that we are uh, under benchmark. Our revenue is not coming in exactly the way that we would have wanted. Um, most of it is capital gains, some of it is for budget, so we're trying to be cautious with what we do with uh, funding uh, things f to finish up this year as well as for next year. Uh, but we did base um, and build a budget on a 2.7% revenue increase from 19 over 20, which would start this uh, July. You know, as you know, the governor came out with his bill proposal, budget proposal in January. The House will do theirs in April, Senate in May, and then hopefully our conference committee can work it out and have a, 
a state budget by the end of June. Um, but the state's fiscal health actually remains strong. So uh, we were above benchmark for February, which helped you know, bring us up. We think a lot of it may have to do with the federal tax changes that occurred that would have been filed in, in December and January, normally under our process and is being extended for several months because of the federal changes. Um, we, so overall, our economic outlook still remains good. And um, you know, in talking with the governor, they're not worried yet, or administration and finance, about the dip in, in revenue and <coughs> it being under benchmark. Um, I'm happy to say that uh, over the last year, we were able to put $700 million into the state's rainy day fund, so we now have over $2 billion in there. Um, it's great. We have, we have made great strides with that. It's not a matter of if there's going to be another recession. It's a matter, as we all know, when. So uh, that will happen. Um, and, and I can talk about, you know, if you want at some point Chapter 70 or, um, you know, the, what may happen with the, the governor's bill that came out, made some changes with Chapter 70. We are hoping to pass a bill uh, that may, we, we may even get it done before the budget this time, the Foundation Budget Review Commission's recommendations that would make some changes to the education funding formula. Um, and take into account the recommendations to fund health care. Uh, for example, in 1993, when Chapter 70 was first done, health care insurance wasn't even a part of the, the state's reimbursement or consideration as to how much does it cost to, uh, to educate our children. Clearly, not only is it a big part, but it's you know strangling school districts, towns, and you know others, people, you know their budgets across the state. So it takes into account health care, um, ELL students, low-income students, and special education, supplementing both in district and out of district, which would help our cities and towns across the state. Um, we're hoping that to get that done, we came very close to doing it at the end of last session. And um, I know that the chairs of the Education Committee have already met and sort of tried to map out a strategy. So that's something that I think would be very significant. It would be the most significant change of the Ed Law um, in the last couple of decades. So, it, and, and eventually, it will help Hopkinton with increased funding as well. Um, so so you know, there, there's that. Um, I won't necessarily go into all um, that's happened. The, chart, the, uh, the special education funding that is a part of it would help. That would supplement the special ed circuit breaker funding that we have made an attempt to fully fund the last few years. This past for 2019, it is at the full 75 percent that helping, you know, all of the schools and, and Hopkinton benefits from that as well. Um, there's other things that we're looking at in terms of charter school reimbursements and, and other areas uh, of funding that will be part of the discussion for school funding as well. I do just want to mention, um, as, as I look at you know, the, the next upcoming session, the priorities that I have in addition to uh, the education uh, funding and making changes. It, it touches on other areas as well, from uh, education to transportation to climate change, and um, looking at housing, all looking towards lasting prosperity for the Commonwealth. Uh, Health care is an area also that we came very close to uh, having a major health care reform and cost containment bill the end of last session. I'm hoping that we can do another bill that would make some major reforms and build on what we looked at last year and um, save, save money for not only our consumers but for our cities and towns across the Commonwealth as well. There are some initiatives. We will be looking at that, but that's another uh, major issue, priority issue, that I think that we need to look at along with the rising costs of prescription drugs. 
Climate change is another area that I think almost anything that we look at should be looked at to the, uh, through the lens of climate change, whether it be transportation reform, housing, or other issues. Uh, it's something that, that we need to really focus on. And uh, I believe that Massachusetts can be a leader in this area, not only in climate change, adaptation, and resiliency, but job creation. You know, we, we've started doing it, and I think that we have the possibility to really be a, a job creator. We grabbed it with offshore wind. We were the first on the whole northeast coast, and we've added more megawatts over the years for offshore wind. So the industries from Denmark and some of the other countries are coming here to build their manufacturing facilities here, their headquarters here, their jobs here in Massachusetts, which will be helpful. Um, you know, other areas to, for smart environmental change, I believe we need to be working with our cities and towns like Hopkinton as to what more can we do. It's not just the coastal areas that need the resiliency and the adaptation, it's inland as well. So I think that that's really important. The other two areas I just want to note that, you know, I'm forming a working group in the Senate would be transportation. Um, I've been speaking a lot about that. And after two and a half hour ride into Boston this morning, it's and almost an hour and a half on the way back, um, it's really frustrating. Everywhere I go, transportation, congestion, traffic is like the hot topic, the major topic of everybody. And we can't, we can't keep putting that off. Um, so we're, we're looking at transportation infrastructure, as well as um, asking the chair of the Senate Committee, uh, the Senate on Revenue, to do an informal working group as well to look at uh, our revenue and, and how can it hasn't been looked at in, in decades. Um, so what can we do to make our, our tax code stronger, fairer, and still provide the services and programs that we want to provide? So that, that's um, just a smattering. And the, la the last thing I want to mention, which is a personal issue for me, uh, is mental health. Um, as some of you know, my father had mental illness. And this is an issue that is very important for me. So I um, really would like to try to work to make making mental health care as routine as we do with our physical care and approach it in the same way, get rid of the stigma. Um, and uh, have true mental health parity and insurance for once and for all. So those are, are that's the overall agenda that, that um, I have at the start of this new legislative session. It's exciting. Um, there's a lot going on. The Senate and the House are, are very busy uh, working with very closely the administration in making sure that we get things done for people of Hopkinton and the Commonwealth. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Can we ask questions? I'll wait. Do you want to do questions at the end, or you want to do questions now, or? Well, we can take a few questions now, and then go to Representative Dykema, and then kind of have an all all around. If you have something you'd like to ask. Yeah, I, I was at the uh, MMA uh, last month, and I guess no, it's two months ago now, and they were talking about the Chapter Seventy. It, now, has any of that passed at all, the, the, the new algorithm? No. Okay. No, it, it came really close the last night of the session, but um, there's redoubling their efforts. We're starting again, and I do believe that it will pass. I'm hoping this year, not, it, we, not even next year, second year of the two-year session, but I think both the House and the Senate uh, are, will try to get it done this year. It was really exciting to hear, you know, the... the um you know, the, the changes to, to bring up, you know, adding the ESL, adding the health care, adding uh, uh, some more of the SPED stuff. It just sounded real exciting. That's why I was, I, I was hoping that, that that went through. And, and, and my only other one is, is, you know, keep protecting us on the Mass Pike. Uh, oh God, you know, yeah. be, and, and, you know, it, because we, you know, we, we continue to, to foot the bill for every, for all the other construction projects. And just like you said, when we want to use it, it's an hour and a half to get into town. Right. And the Southeast Expressway, they rebuilt that beautiful tunnel for all those guys, and they don't pay anything. 
Right, and I remind Secretary Pollack that very frequently. And when I talk to her about um, the viaduct that they want to build along the Beacon Yard and lowering the pike and raising Starrow Drive and fixing some of the train, uh, which will eventually help our commuters, which is great, but it's like an eight-year project. And I asked her, well, how are you going to pay for this? And some of it was through bonding, some of it was through state funds, and possibly some of it was through toll increases. So I said, well, are there tolls for plans for other areas of the state or at the borders? The response was, not yet. So I said, well, then don't count on toll increases to pay for this. We need to come up with alternatives. Or I believe that we should be looking at tolls at other areas of the state and at the borders. Um, Connecticut is looking at it, Rhode Island, some other states. Now is the time where the federal government may be approving states to put tolls on federal roads, and we should be looking into that and applying for that. We could also, we don't need their approval for state roads. So we should, if tolls are such a great idea for the pike and for raising money to fix the infrastructure, it should be a great idea for all of our roads. Because I know it used to be that we can't put up toll boots or anything, but with the... We have the with, gantries with now. With the gantries now, you know, not that I want anybody saying that John's uh, advocating for, for, for more taxes and tolling and stuff like that, but no, but, but you know, the, the rest it's of fairness. the state... It's fairness. It really comes yeah. down to fairness and, and, and why, you know, for the, for the past uh, 50 years that uh, we've been paying for, for yeah. the, rest of the, uh, the rest of the state. Yes, I've raised that with the governor, Thanks for always too. protecting us. Yes. I, know you're, I, I think you're, the Metro S delegation is all united mm -hmm. in this, and, and we will fight that. So, Great, thanks. thank you. Good. All right for now? I'm thinking, let's go to Ben, <laughs> so we can... So, thank you, Karen. Yeah. Thank you for having us. It's, uh, it's great to be here, and I was, I was watching Tim killed up up here, and I thought, it's almost marathon time again. I can't believe it. So exciting time to be here. Um, and I just, the transportation conversation is definitely something that has, has escalated recently. I think the congestion on the Mass Pike has reached new levels. And if you look at um, the statistics that have come out, that, that sort of bears out. And I think one of the uh, downsides of an up economy, it's exciting to have all the jobs, but I think there's also a, a commensurate increase in traffic, which is challenging for anyone to go into town. And um, one of the things I've been focusing on has been the commuter rail. I know there are a lot of commuter rail riders here in Hopkinton. Uh, I personally have two commuter rail stops in my district, the one in Southboro uh, and the one in Westboro. And uh, of course, at Ashland, I know, is, is used frequently by Hopkinton residents. And uh, we do not have the reliability nor the frequency that we need to have, uh, given the economic opportunity here in Metro West and given the number of commuters that we have going into Boston. So I've made that one of my priorities. Uh, I serve on a couple of groups. One is the vision study for um, commuter rail, which is a state uh, level uh, look at what is the commuter rail going to look like in 2040 and how are we going to plan out investments to have uh, a reliable commuter rail infrastructure that um, addresses the concerns that I've, I've heard about uh, lack of timeliness. Uh, we need some new locomotives. A lot of our locomotives are, you know, 50 years old, well past their useful lives. We've been working to try and get them um, refurbished, and a number of those are starting to come into service now, so we're hoping we'll see some improvements there day-to-day uh, -day for the riders. So I think it, along with the Mass Pike, I think part of that solution is to improve commuter rail, so that is very much in the works. Um, I thought I would mention a couple of uh, local things that we've been working on. So there was a senior property tax exemption for here in Hopkinton that I know was passed at town meeting, and we worked to get that passed in the legislature, and that was done, which was uh, great to work with you folks on that, uh, signed by the governor in August of 2018. Um, I also filed, uh, many of you know I'm doing a lot of work on veterans, and I've, that's been since the beginning of my tenure in the legislature, and I work very closely with the VSO, Sarah Bateman, who is a regional VSO here and works closely with veterans. And uh, there is a uh, fund, a veterans fund, that allows uh, for certain uses for uh, monies collected through the town to go out to support veterans' needs, one-time needs. 
um, including uh, oil, for example, and a few other things. And, and in meeting with the veteran service officer, we found that there are some needs, specifically legal cost and short-term rental assistance that are not currently allowed by the, by the state law. So I filed some legislation that would expand the uses um, of those funds here locally in all the towns um, served by our, our VSOs to do that. Um, this is the beginning of the legislative session for us. And so um, Senate President, obviously, on her side, is, is uh, in a very specific role. I just got assigned to four new committees that I had not served on before, one of which is the Vice Chair of uh, Telecommunications, Utilities, and Energy. And we recently had a visit, as, as some of you may have seen, up to the Eversource facility here in Hopkinton. Um, one of the things that the committee covers is gas infrastructure, which uh, is very important here to the town and obviously a much, uh, is very much on the radar for a lot of folks given what happened in the Merrimack Valley not too long ago and focus specifically on safety and how can we make sure that our gas infrastructure is safe. So um, I worked with Eversource to um, get a number of folks up to look at our facility, to familiarize them with what was here in Hopkinton, uh, not only to see the tanks that are up on the hill and kind of see what the safety measures were on site, but also uh, also in my district in South Bro is the, the SCADA facility, which does the oversight on safety for the facility here in Hopkinton. And Chief Slayman came with us, and we really heard from soup to nuts uh, from the folks at Eversource who are managing that safety facility, kind of what happens, you know, how do they monitor safety, how do they respond, how are they in touch with our local public safety officials to make sure the town is well served. Um, and uh, we got a great great overview of things there um, and I've also filed some legislation really having heard um, some concerns uh, more in, in terms of what we can do better to make sure that we are kind of belt and suspenders making sure that we have as many eyes and ears and oversight on the front lines as, as possible so I filed a piece of legislation that would provide for more inspectors on um, gas infrastructure statewide, as well as to make sure that the engineering oversight of some of these repair projects is what it needs to be uh, and consistently across the state. So I'll be moving that forward um, in the committee um, upcoming. The, um, you had talked about uh, toll funding, and one of the things that we did a number of years ago was to make sure that tolls that are collected on our highways are actually used on our highways to benefit those folks that pay them. Uh, and while we certainly uh, don't appreciate the fact that we're the only folks paying tolls, at least the tolls that we do pay, we want to see coming back locally. And one of those projects is the 495-90 intersection redesign, which uh, is well underway. I just thought I would give a, a quick update on that. The plans are still in the works, and that is um, on the tip and looking to be um, committed $270 million in funding. Um, including some of that money from federal resources to do a redesign um, to alleviate some of the traffic and congestion uh, at that intersection. Uh, economically, there's a, a study that's put forth by the 495 Metro West Partnership every few years about transportation nightmare, nightmares in our area, and that is one of them that has been one of them for a long time, so we're glad that we're going to be able to finally make some uh, headway on that regional priority. And uh, lastly, the, the Main Street quarter funding. Uh, that has been something that's been in the works for the town for a long time. And just wanted to let you know that we are very much keeping an eye on that, making sure that uh, that stays on the tip list for the town um, and uh, just keeping an eye on it to make sure that uh, that funding is available when everyone is ready to move forward with that project. I want to just mention Aerosource because you brought it up. and. Um, backing up a bit to say thank you you probably both remember not that long ago there's a whole issue with aerosource gas gate here in town there was quite a public outcry i know we reached out to our legislators for their support and their input and i think the combination of pressures including pressures from uh state house really did make a difference and as you know it, it turned that situation around and they where there was no other alternative all of a sudden there was another alternative and and the situation was resolved in our favor so we really really appreciate when that kind of assistance can 
can be given to us because sometimes an individual community feels sort of powerless. Uh, and I'm really glad to hear of what is currently percolating with respect to Eversource and just want to say and ask for any kind of assistance that can be given at any any level to get these utilities, particularly Eversource, to be more responsive to their local communities because we recognize they enjoy certain broad protections all the way up to the federal level. And, you know, Hopkinton, we've got our LNG. I've been reading issues about Ashland with their problems with the pipeline section going through. You hear what's gone on with, with up in the Merrimack Valley. It all seems to be symptomatic of a, of a large degree of unresponsiveness or feel that they don't need to be responsive to local communities and local concerns because they don't have to be. And sometimes that ends up with tragic results. And um, so, you know, we're all working at this together and we all want, we all want the good gas resources, it's important to us, but there's certainly a price to be paid. So whatever assistance and influence on a number of levels can be brought for this whole region, I, I, it's very much appreciated and, and continuing to be a real need for us. Okay. Yeah, I do want to also mention that we will continue to look into that and work with Eversource, working closely with all of you and the town manager. and. Um, trying to convey the concerns and work with them. Um, we are passing a supplemental budget, uh, and there is uh, a couple of million dollars in there for the Department of Public Utilities <coughs> to have a consultant do a study for the pipeline systems across the state as well in the aftermath of what happened in Merrimack Valley, trying to uh, take one more step to ensure that that doesn't ever happen again. <coughs> and, and I think just generally being bringing, in some way bringing pressure to bear to encourage these utilities to be willing to work with the communities. Maybe their asks are really small in the big picture, but they're important to the community. And uh, you know, just because they don't have to isn't isn't reason not to if it's if it's something that'll make us all coexist a little better. <laughs> so um, definitely. I jumped in there. Mr. Tetstone, did you have any questions or comments? Yeah, a couple of comments. So, um, um, Madam Senate President, thank you for finding some time to come out here today. Appreciate that and your busy schedule. Um, you spoke of uh, health care. Um, it's nice to know, so we as a, as a board have our eyes on health care. Um, it's nice to know that statewide, that you have your your eyes on it and, and that you're actively working on that it's yeah. a it's a crazy um it, 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 it's just it, almost unregulated um just the the expenses are insane uh, i followed that uh martin scarelli all those hearings with martin scarelli and, and trey gowdy and and that drug that he that he's put up 56 fold or something like that and um, you know, if it's if if we're pushing back and you're pushing back, and nationally it's pushing back, it's on everybody's radar, and there's a good chance that it'll, you may not stop it, but it'll definitely slow it down. Yeah, we um, worked with the Millbank Foundation for almost two years, and they connected us, and we actually went like to Minnesota, in the middle of December, a blizzard. We're there in Minnesota, meeting with a lot of the healthcare folks there. And we, we went to several of the other states to hear what they're doing, how they're controlling costs, um, how they're making some changes to both private health care and Medicaid, came back and continued to explore it and uh, ended up passing a pretty comprehensive health care reform bill. Um, the House did one as well. Again, we came close. There are certain things that we have trouble, like with some aspects of prescription drugs, we can't totally control the cost there, but we believe that we can be doing more and we can be making, for example, the like we have for the health, health insurance companies, they go to the Health Policy Commission to justify their rate increases, that we can do something similar 
for the drug manufacturers here in Massachusetts where they have to be more transparent and open about their costs and what they are charging for their pharmaceutical drugs to, to help control the rising costs of pharmaceuticals. And there are other things we've, we've looked at, telemedicine, that can really help control the costs where, particularly in the rural areas, make the tele, telemedicine more, more uh, available and looking at ways to use either a new sort of, maybe not an EMT, but something like that for preventative. They're finding, for example, several of the states found that by allowing some of the EMT-like services, people get out of the hospital, they go home after a heart attack or some cardiac episode, they get pains, they immediately call the ambulance. As soon as the ambulance is called, they have to go back into the hospital. They're there for a few more days. The costs go up. If they have somebody that goes to their home that very day and then the next day, uh, the costs uh, that, that are saved are just amazing in the long run. It really helps control the cost. So even sometimes little things that turn out to be big savings, so a lot of these things we're looking at and other more uh, intense areas as well. Um, and you touched on the mental health. <clears throat> so I'm a nurse and I'm a nurse and I'm a manager for a rehab that um, I work in the Alzheimer's unit. Um, very heavy in the mental health aspect. I'm also uh, for seven or eight years now a nurse at the maximum security prison in Shirley. Uh, laden in mental health issues. <clears throat> so I can tell you that the stigma of mental health is certainly not today what it was X amount of years ago. You know, it used to be if, so, if you found out that someone was on Prozac, you'd look at them with a, you know, with a raised eyebrow. And it's uh, socially, I think it's being very much more accepted, recognized as a true affliction um, where mental health issues can can be as, as common and prevalent as the flu. Um, unfortunately, just generally not as temporary as the flu. So I think with your work in the State House um, and uh, knowing that it's hit you personally, you know, it, it's uh, obviously a lot of my uh, comments are, are healthcare derived because that's kind of what I know. Um, so it's a, I, I certainly appreciate all the work that you're doing on the mental health aspect as well as Thank the you. Any ideas, please pass them on. No, you don't They're want They're all ideas. welcome. <laughs> you don't want my ideas. You're smarter than me. And I think it's, it's worth mentioning when we're talking about the mental health, the related is the opiate um, crisis, which hasn't come up, but is um, you know still very yeah. much on the front burner. If you look, look at the statistics, um, you know it's, it's a, a long road to get get beyond some of these dramatic numbers about deaths. And now we're seeing a lot more of the fentanyl um, and even now the car fentanyl, which is even, you know, 100 times more powerful than the fentanyl. So, you know, looking at it on the treatment end, the mental health end, the recovery end, at the same time trying to stem the tide of a lot of these, these uh, synthetic drugs coming into the market locally. So we really, you know, pretty much approaching it from every angle possible. And what's been um, kind of an eye-opener for me is the, the way that this problem kind of goes out into the community and now we're talking about children yeah. you know who are being Im impacted by the trauma of having parents or who are um, overdosing in front of them and then they're going to school and so it really does have very wide-ranging community impacts and as we know it's everywhere you know it's not limited to any any community it's in every community in every state and uh, I would say that this is going to be something we're going to be coming up you know session after session trying to find new ways and looking for new ideas to deal with it and to support communities locally as they try to work from the ground up. Yeah. Um, I know the last couple of years we've gotten um, some funding in the state budget for local uh, groups right. to be able to do a lot of the local work in the community working with families trying to address this stigma issue to, to help people talk about it, right? Because if you can't talk about it, you can't get the help that you need. Yeah. Right. We were able to get $75,000 for Hopkinton Organizing for Prevention.
program and then another 75,000 for the substance abuse prevention program at the high school, which you know is a great start and, and they, both of those programs do great work um, and, and they're leading the way. So uh, it's, it's wonderful to be able to support them with that. So w working in the prison, <clears throat> um, the, at Sousa, at the maximum security, Bridgewater is not equipped <coughs> to handle maximum security inmates. So any mental health issues, any <clears throat> drug issues, any detoxing, things like that, that has to be done in-house. So I have uh, a lot of, uh, a lot of first-hand um, knowledge on, on that, uh, that when you said the synthetic drugs, that K2 is very, very prevalent in the prisons and it's the most insane, it turns, it, it turns from Dr. Jekyll to Mr. Hyde or vice versa, however that works. But, um, it's it really is it's amazing I don't consider it a disease I don't consider it and that's my personal opinion I don't think that the opioids is a disease I think it's an affliction um, I've had many arguments with many people about it and it's my opinion and you know you can't go to the street corner and say give me a syringe full of cancer um, that's a it's cancer is a disease I think it's a horrible affliction and it, it hits everybody on every social economic background it doesn't matter if you're loaded with money or you're, you have none it hits everybody, and it, it's a it's a very tough, tough disease. So, um, I mean, tough. Sorry, tough affliction. Um, well, that's why I do think that that attacking the mental health side more uh, robustly will help. I I don't think all opioid addiction or addictions are stemming from mental health or mental unmet mental health needs, but I think a lot of them are. So, if we can meet the mental health needs of our residents, hopefully that will also cut down in addiction issues. Yeah. And for, um, for Carolyn, um, it's nice to see you throughout the year at, at all the veterans events. <laughs> um, you know, I've had the pleasure to sit with you at the last couple at the, at the gun club and uh, just, it's, it's just nice to see your presence out there at every community thing it seems that goes on and you're just there. And uh, you're a very, <clears throat> you're, you're, you're a treasure uh, I certainly love having you around. Uh, it was nice to speak with you at Bob LaVoy's funeral. Um, you know, it's just, it's nice to, to know that you're there. And, and if I need to send you an email, I get a response back. And I'm not saying that I don't get that from you, Senator. I just, I just generally have more conversations with, uh, with uh, Ms. Dykema. Um, so I just want to say thanks for all the work that you do for our town. Both of you, thank you for the work that you do for our town. And uh, keep up the good work. Because if you don't, we're going to hold you to it. <laughs> um, we have a post public hearing for 745 so what I would like to do is just open that and then put that aside for a few minutes if the applicant is willing so we can continue because I don't want to we really appreciate you taking the time to to come I'll make a motion to uh, open the public mm -hmm. hearing for the underground propane storage by uh, Faith Community Church that the, that's yes, th this is a, a public <coughs> hearing relative to an application by Margie Selman on behalf of Faith Community Church to store five 1,000 gallon tanks of LP gas underground. Fire Chief has approved the required permit. This is an amended license for underground propane storage for Faith Community Church. Um, it, may I have a motion to open the hearing? So moved. Second. <coughs> Second. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed. Okay. That's unanimous. Is there a representative from the Faith Church here? If you don't mind, uh, we'd just like to finish with um, Representative Dykema and Senator Spilka and then proceed to the public hearing. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. So, all right, all right. so I'll, make, I'll make mine quick. <coughs> We're speaking about the, uh, the fentanyl issue. Um, you know, there is a uh, Thermo Fisher has this uh, device. It's an optical device called TrueNock, and I was just wondering if 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 it's possible to look into that, so that our, just like our public officials now have this have the stun gun, so that they don't have to go to lethal force. This is just something that uh, it's it's an optical device that they just aim it at a at a uh, baggie or something, and it can tell them what it what they what the uh, substance is before they even touch it. 
Mm -hmm. Because that's what it's, it's called True Narc by True Thermo Fisher. And it's, it's been out several years, and, and uh, many of the communities around us ha have it. And it's, it's not a very expensive item, but I just think it's one of those things that, um, you know, considering that the, the new fentanyl that's out, that's just so frightening for uh, public safety officials. Yeah. And, um, uh, you know, just like this, it's just another, another tool that they can do, have to uh, protect themselves. And my only other one is um, back to uh, uh, Eversource and the and and the relationship with the DPU. You know, and whenever we push back, they hide behind the DPU and and they get a carte blanche. You know, when we're talking about repair projects, how you know, just like when when one is repairing a building or a home at a certain at a certain uh, dollar value uh, percentage of the home. All other things kick in when you talk about commercial. That's when you have to make make it a, a building accessible and such. And um, you know, I was just hoping that something like that might be able to be enacted with um, with Eversource when they're doing a major repair, sort of like what they were doing before. They were saying, "Oh, it's just a maintenance," but in actual, they they totally changed the the the, the whole place just so they wouldn't have to abide by the new federal standards. But at some point, we want to make sure that, that they're not using 1950s and 60s standards, that they're going to the ones that, that are more generally accepted nowadays. And whatever, whatever pressure you can, you can bring to bear, because again, thank you for the two of you for helping on the gas gate. Meeting in, in your office was just wonderful, and I think that that sent a message that, that the two of you were behind us. And it, and it really worked. So again, thank you for that. And, and, just, and I hope that the, a similar thing can happen with our relationship with, the, um, with Eversource. Just be a, a community host agreement, something, if they could just come to us and work with us. Because we don't ask for a lot. We just want to be safe. One of the things that I know we at that same meeting, I think we had talked about this um, lack of, of DPU oversight of this particular gas infrastructure. And um, one of the provisions that I did add to this gas safety bill that I filed does have to do with additional DPU oversight over certain projects that would, you know, should we get it passed, would facilitate some of similar conversations about this. So the, the concern is is recognized, and I, I agree that, you know, just from a safety perspective now that we're, we've seen you know, what can happen when there isn't proper oversight and uh, isn't proper safety protocol that we, you know, hopefully we'll be able to have a serious conversation about that. Great. Thank you very much. We really do need help from a higher power. The real higher power, <laughs> but then the lower higher power, too. <laughs> so, Thank you. Mr. Nasser, if you have Thank any you. comments, please. So, um, just to springboard off the Eversource piece, um, I think the deep, you know, the, the oversight, the DPU oversight is uh, certainly appreciated, but I think... Um, I think community involvement and just getting, you know, getting the word from the people in the town, um, having community meetings, let us know what's going on and take suggestions. I think how can that how can that be bad? That that really would foster the you know the public p partnership between the towns and and uh, the utilities. Um, so I thank you for everything that you do there. We um, can certainly raise that with, with Eversource to do that more and to participate, be a more active community mm -hmm. member. Mm -hmm. I think that would be reassuring to the public at large, especially after what happened in the right. Merrimack Valley. Um, I would like to thank you both for all the work that you've been doing. Uh, I think the Veterans Affairs work is, is incredible, fuel assistance. I mean, it's this is really important stuff and I think it's something that uh, we need people who have given to this country you know we need to give back so I, I truly appreciate everything you do there um, I appreciate also the foresight that you have in looking at all projects with uh, climate change in mind and that's that's one of the things that you know when, when we had our kids that was one of the, that was my biggest fear is like what world will they live in with with a warming planet? We just saw the polar vortex come through. We're seeing the, the California wildfires, and what's going to come next? <laughs> you know, it can it can be scary. And I think I think having a little bit of vision and looking at what what's coming our way and what could come our way and how are we going to manage that is uh, is critical. But um, we can't just accept that it's coming. I think we also need to take measures to, to oppose it. As a new uh, electric vehicle owner, um, 
I would love to see a lot more infrastructure for, for electric vehicles. Uh, it only makes sense, and uh, it's far more fun to drive. <laughs> right. We should have the infrastructure. We should have more incentives for uh, people to want to buy. And we should get more of the, the car companies. It's, it's, um, they, they need to be producing more as well so that there are better choices among the choices and that they can go further. But that's when, you know, the batteries and the storage is another area that I think Massachusetts, we, we are the innovation economy. If any state can come up with good storage in batteries for uh, electric cars, for saving the electricity produced by offshore wind and solar to store it for another time, if we don't need to use it all, Massachusetts should be able to do that. And that's one area that I'm hoping we, we grab the, uh, the innovation and the jobs with that as well. And I think we're well suited to. Um, I, I, I was amazed when I flew over, uh, I flew out to California, and on the way back I flew over Arizona. And flying over Massachusetts, you see solar panels everywhere. And over Arizona, I didn't see a single one. And it just makes me wonder, okay, well, <laughs> we're leading the way. Here we are up in the cold northeast, and we're still able to make the use of the sun. And uh, we have the incentives. And our solo guy's not here to really <laughs> talk about everything that you we guys do for us. himself. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, um, but I think that's, that's it's critical. Um, and I think we've been leading the way. Um, I don't understand why a state like Arizona wouldn't have. <laughs> all, all solar. Um, are we all sitting here? We, this is a joint meeting with the school committee as well, and I do apologize for the seating arrangement with your backs, people with their backs to them, but we have also have five members of the school committee, plus the school's superintendent, plus their business manager, Susan Rothermish. So um, I would certainly like the school committee to get their chance to chime in. Um, have at it. Please. Uh, Again, I, we apologize for the seating arrangements. Not to, uh, not to suggest you up. I could flip this around and make it sit here. Would want two chairs there, but well, maybe someone would, who would like to speak would like to at least come up and use Mr. Nazarul's microphone, if you like. Two at a time there. <laughs> so thank you both so much for coming. Uh, it, always a pleasure to see you both in the district, and as Mr. Tenstone said before, we do see you quite, we're fortunate to see you quite a bit. Uh, I am concerned about a lot of things in Hopkinton, and I love a lot of what you said that will impact us uh, positively. The foundation budget stuff is huge for us. I'm also concerned with unfunded mandates and how um, that impacts us and the growth. I know that both of you are aware of the growth that we've gone through as a town and how that's impacted our schools has been particularly difficult. Uh, the number of students we have coming in just daily, we've had it just since we passed our budget, we've had an additional 50 students come into the district. So that's, it's hard to project what we need right now for next year and it's difficult to be able to continue to meet the needs. And then on top of that, the space issues that we have. Uh, we had, it, was it last week that we were here with the uh, statement of interest uh, for the MSBA for the Elmwood School, which is our, uh, currently our 2-3 school. I know you were both at the opening for the marathon, right. which it is It came our, out beautiful, it's a beautiful school. It did, and it was a beautiful process with the MSBA, and we felt so fortunate to be able to get it done. But we now, as we've seen the growth go through that, we're, it's coming up through each of our schools and we're going to need sig some significant investment into our schools to keep them able to meet the needs of the number of students we have. So that's just to put that on your radar, we are getting ready sub to submit, I think it's our third submission to the MSBA this year for the Elmwood School. I know it's probably a little tricky when we had one in process with the Marathon School, but now that Marathon is done, we are hoping to get called in um, for Elmwood before we're coming out all kinds of different themes. So that was one I also... So can I just oh, ask yes. you, I know that the 2018-2019 school year has exceeded enrollment projections by almost 200 yes. students, right? What, what, are, what is the major age group there? So is it, is it the elementary? Or it, so we see it at a couple of different entry points. We see it, 
people seem to want to come, and Dr. Kavanaugh has said this more eloquently, I don't want to steal her words, but yeah. they come <laughs> in at different points in the district. The first point is we see, saw a, a big surge at the kindergarten for people who presumably want the full K-12 to experience. The next grouping we see is a jump in kids coming in in the sixth grade, and then the eighth, ninth grade for kids who want to come or families who want their kids to be here for the, either the middle and, middle and high school years or just the high school years. So those groups seem to be hit the hardest, but of course the, those kindergartners are going to trickle up and right. feel across the district. We, we find that our kids, once they come, it, our grades don't, we don't see big groups dropping off at any point. We had growth in across the district, but just more particularly in those grade points. Is anything good there? So, I don't want, I don't want to jump in. No, go something. ahead, finish up. I do have one question, okay. but I'm late. So, the mental health uh, is a huge th thing. I am a mental health clinician, so that is big for me in my professional life as well, but also from the school committee side. I very much appreciated being at your social-emotional learning, and that was, you know, I've lost track of when that was, but that was a great event, and it, it means a lot to see that at the state <coughs> level, to see that that is a, a focus for your office and for coming through the Senate. Right. This is our third year yeah. doing that, and we'll continue, so again, any That's suggestions great. for for the next, per, next, uh, next time would be great. It, it is, though, I, I know from the school Point, it's a challenge to try to find the programs that are going to meet our kids' needs so that we're not just reacting to issues that pop up so that we're able to be a little bit more proactive rather than reactive uh, and just where we're able to build some of those programs and to grow some of that to protect our kids while we're at the same time battling growth and enrollment issues and trying to tackle other unfunded mandates in the state. Right. Well, you know, one, one thing that, that with the, the mental health initiative and um, as Senate Chair Ways and Means, I tried to put more funds in for programs and services to tackle the, the mental health issues and concerns, both from kids early on, the different programs, to creating the family resource centers that now at least we have one in Framingham. I'm hoping it, it expands in Metro West. For, and to, through adults, but also in schools, you know, we, we did put some funds in for um, expanding mental health counselors in some of the larger school districts, and I'm hoping to have that trickle down to, to all schools. So again, if, I, if you have some specific ideas as to how to help, please forward them on to us. That would be great. I'm not sure I have solutions, but I, I will, I'm happy to forward thoughts okay, that I have great. just from Thank you. the side. But. Thank you again, both of you, for being here and for all of the work that you do on behalf of our district and for the rest of the Commonwealth. Much appreciated. Yeah, I, I also feel the same way. I think everyone's been talking about this. I catch up a little bit of what all you do through social media, and it's amazing the amount of work that both of you do and all the places you seem to show up. Um, one thing, this is just me being one voice um, asking this question and actually first starting with thanking you both uh, for having supported the gifted education study in Massachusetts. It's something which is very close and dear to me. And um, you know, you have very openly talked about mental health and acceptance of that. And I worry about the social emotional needs of this group of students in, in the state and all over. It is not their choice that this label has been put on them. It's a very heavy label which a lot of people struggle with. Um, but, so I wonder what is it that we could do in terms of first recognizing that these kids exist and their particular social emotional needs and how is it that we can do something uh, to recognize and address their needs. Yeah, I know there are some bills that were filed this year to um, address them. They Again, the, the session's just getting started, but uh, if you want, we could forward you the bill numbers and, and summaries of, of the bills so that you could at least follow that. Um, and I know that, that there's discussion about putting some um, funding for grant programs in the budget as well to address some of these issues. 
And I, I think the commission that was established, right, that you were referencing, um, that it was established, I think, in last year's budget, that the role of a commission generally is to get experts around the table to come up with just the kind of recommendations that you're talking about, you know, to identify where students have needs, where the state can intervene with supportive services. So the hope would be out of that commission would come a series of recommendations that would then come back to both the House and the Senate to, to allow us to then, you know, file legislation or put in place actionable um, steps forward to address just the kind of needs you're talking about. Thank you. Thank you for what you're doing. It's not easy. We have so many things to deal with. And this is one of those things um, that I feel uh, should come out in the open to however difficult the conversation is. Thank you. Thank you for raising it. I don't know. Any of the I just wanted to come up. Do you need to be heard? Can you go here? Yep. Can you come to the big chair? Yeah. Just can't talk about solo on that. <laughs> <laughs> Um, to piggyback off one of the things that Nancy mentioned, I think the unfunded mandates in education is, is just a problem across the board, and it's one of the things that I know it's constantly a work in progress. But in particular, based on the growth that we've seen in the community over the last couple of years, the last 30 days, um, lots of these children are coming in with special education needs as well. And so I think if we can continue to sort of hammer away at, you know, if the state is going to require, and for sure the needs of the children dictate that we need to provide these services, the cost of these services, special education is an enormous, enormous part of our school budget. And I think that we need to um, make sure that the laws say we need to require these services, but I mean, we need to require these services as sort of a moral obligation to the, to the needs of these children. And it's an enormous cost to the community. Um, I don't know the numbers off the top of my head, but I know that many of the children that have come into the community, even in the last school year calendar, come in with special needs. So it's, it's, a, it's definitely one of the things that we've focused on in building our budget. But we would love some help. Right. Well, that, that's part of the Foundation Budget Review Commission's recommendations. Uh, it would increase the assumed percentage of, of special ed students in, in school. So school districts would get a bump out of that. Um, and it would, uh, in, the, in, the, in the budget, it, it addresses both in-district and out-of-district. So right now, the circuit breaker does more of the out-of-district costs. but. Again, we, we, and I will try, and I think the House has a, it as a priority, too, to fully fund the special ed circuit breaker, but the Foundation Budget Review Commission's changes would be in addition to the special money that cities and towns get from the special education circuit breaker, so that that would increase the funding that Hopkinton would get for that. Which would be great, and, and along with that, too, the transportation piece which is the other giant chunk of our of our budget, um, which is increasing as a result of increased enrollment, but also because with children who require special education transportation, that adds to. So I mean, all of these things. It's you know growth, unfunded mandates, transportation. You, you mentioned them all in, in in your presentation, but it's just you know the communities are feeling that, and so just to make sure that we keep working to to do what we can to soften the blow. Thank you. I'll leave the seat now. All right. <laughs> Comment. Mr. Kamala, please. Um, through the chair, allow me to add to uh, the sentiments of gratitude that have been expressed by board members. Uh, specifically, I want to take this opportunity to thank your professional teams who we work with regularly, uh, whether it's calling Dave or is calling members of your team. Uh, they're always very responsive, they're professional, and they have assisted us in, in many cases. I do have a question, though, regarding local aid. Uh, granted, the, you've heard so much regarding the growth in this community. Uh, the budget that was proposed by the governor was less than fair uh, to Hopkinton. I think our local aid only went up by 18,000, in spite of the growth that has been um, uh, talked about tonight. So I'm wondering. Are we going to have a local aid resolution soon? And I ask that question because I also heard that the budget process may be finishing in June. That's pretty much late for towns. So I'm wondering whether we're going back to 
you know, three years ago where there was a local aid resolution that will state clearly the levels of local aid so that towns can proceed with their budget processes. Right, right. Um, I can tell you, I mean, June is when we usually let the cities and towns know. Um, what we usually say, though, is you could at least bank on the governor's numbers, and then the, I know the House tries to do more, and if we can, the Senate tries to do more. There's pluses and minuses to having a local aid resolution. If there's an agreement between the House and the Senate, and we say in March or, you know, whatever, at the beginning of April, this is how much you're, you're getting, and then the numbers get even better, it's harder to add to that after there's an agreement. Mm -hmm. But in recognition of the fact that it, we know it does help cities and towns, um, we've raised that with the House to, and started discussions. We haven't done that in a number of years because the finances, if you remember, the last few years have been so iffy. Um, they've been really bad, actually, except for this year, uh, where we had to cut, you know, a hundred, uh, almost a billion dollars two years ago. So um, we'll see. Uh, we, you know, we recognize that this is something that does help um, generally in a lot of ways, and if we can do it, we will. Thank you. I, I just want to say, in, in wrapping up, too, um, we've all been talking about the amount of growth in this town, particularly as it relates to the school population. And, you know, we know the impact on direct education costs, but also there are just so many ancillary uh, effects uh, for all town services and for infrastructure. Uh, we're looking, you know, that bubble of students that right now is being accommodated by the Marathon School, and we are most concerned because our request to get into the MSBA school process for Elmwood has been refused twice, but now that bubble of students, they, they keep growing. You know, they're in first grade now. They're going to be in second or third very soon. So this is creating some real anxiety on the part of the town to literally where are you going to put these students if we can't start to get these building situations taken care of. And of course, all of our town services, increased uh, needs for parks and rec, increased needs for family services, the, the whole, the whole panoply of services. Um, I would also mention you probably where um, Carolyn certainly because she's most familiar with the with the details of the town. Of course we decommissioned our center school last fall, well in June after a marathon came online, but so now we have this building which there's a there are a lot of town departmental needs as well as one really important need to meet is the life skills program for the 18 to 22 year olds which has been taking up some classroom space in one of our other schools which we could stand to free up and also we could stand to expand that program if we could use the center school as well as a whole all the other town services that grow out of town growth um, but that of course you know that's probably a 12 or 15 mil million dollar project to recondition that school so that's another another pressure on our town budgets that come out of out of town growth and so I just wanted to mention the variety of pressures that I know all towns experience these when they experience growth but as you know Hopkinton has really been a standout in the state of Massachusetts for exponential growth right now so you know I just I just want you to be aware of where some of the other concerns lie that if there's any way that assistance can be brought in one way or another to relieve some of those pressures uh, it would it, it's really uh, an important an important thing for us so um, but okay. what you've done and um, we're just so glad that you're, we have you on our team and that you've taken this time and that the communication lines are always, are always so open with both your offices. And um, I think we should probably wrap it up because you have given more than enough time. I think you were scheduled for 45 minutes and you've given us more than an hour and I know you're awful busy. So well, thank, thank you, you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you all. Appreciate all your work. Thank you. Have a great night. We will. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Good to see you too. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
Yeah, absolutely. Good to see you. Thank as you. Always. Good to see Thanks. you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. This best, with this best, the best funds from the uh, veterans fund. Is it this? I just came to look at the best, this best man. Yeah. yeah, thank you. Yeah, it spreads out into everything, doesn't it? Thank you for coming. It's great to see the whole school community there. That sends a message. Yeah. But they need, I know, I know. We gotta work something out with some extra chairs in here. I, I was bad. Good day, thanks. <laughs> I think I can do these people as well. Yeah. I don't see any of the neighbors. I don't want I don't want to. Okay. Um, Faith Community Church, why don't you come on up? I think this is going to be probably pretty straightforward. We do have another public hearing to open at 8.15, but it looked, I don't see a lot of controversy, but that's just me. Uh, so welcome. Uh, again, uh, ladies and gentlemen, this is pursuant to Mass General Law Chapter 148, Section 13. The Board of Selectmen will hold a public hearing relative to an application by Margie Selman on behalf of Faith Community Church to store five 1,000-gallon tanks of liquefied propane gas underground. The fire chief has approved the required permit. That is the actionable line. <laughs> So if you want to give us a quick summary, and if there are board questions, but looking over what was sent, uh, all the permitting teams and the fire chief seem to be happy with what you've got. So just give us the quick, the quick story. <laughs> okay. It um, essentially is a paperwork correction or update. Um, the tanks have been in place for over 10 years, since back in 2014, I mean 2004-ish. Um, and at that point, that was well before my time working at the church, but at that point I think the um, license went through. It came out as a proposed addition. At that time we had 2,000 gallons stored on the property. We put an addition onto the building, which also then we added 3,000 more gallons of storage onto the land. And at that license, at that time in 04, it said, 2,000 existing, three plus 3,000 proposed. So it's, it all went through. It's built. The town knows we have 5,000. The fire department knows we have 5,000. So essentially this is really just amending it to correct the paperwork so that everyone is in line with what is in existence. And Chief, you give your thumbs up. You've looked at this. It meets your requirements. That's what we need to hear. Okay. Any other comments or questions of the board members, or perhaps we can proceed? Mr. Nasrilli. Yeah, quickly. Um, how are these tanks stored? Are they like in concrete containers, and then there's the tank in th on top of that, and that's buried, or is it directly buried in the ground? It's buried. It's underground. The only thing you see um, from the parking lot level are like little domes that stand about this tall, and that's just access points. Okay. to fill the tanks or maintain them. And this might be more for the chief, but... Um, <laughs> Welcome. <laughs> Come sit with me. <laughs> <laughs> Just uh, what, what kind of measures are taken in the tanks to prevent rust and leakage? So the uh, propane filling companies have a responsibility to see that the tanks are in a certain condition. We do a lot of verification through them, and then the fire marshal's office kind of oversees any type of underground storage tanks in that area. So mostly it's the, uh, the actual filling company that makes sure that they follow the regulations and number of years, amount they fill, conditions that they're in. Okay, so they get replaced after a useful life period? They, they would. Um, I'm trying to think for propane tanks what the useful life run would be. Um, I'm not exactly sure. I think it would be like a 20-year evaluation that they have, but I'm going to start guessing at that point. Okay. Okay, I'll request a motion to approve the license for underground propane storage. I think we have storage. to close the public oh, hearing. Oh, uh, I request a motion first to close the public so hearing. So moved. Second. 
I'll move and second and all those in favor please say aye aye, aye. And opposed that is unanimous and now um, I would request a motion to approve the license for underground propane storage as submitted Did we ask for the comment? oh I'm sorry I did not ask for public comment mm -hmm. can I I can, is there I any public here that wants to comment on it? I can reopen the public okay. hearing. Okay, good. Okay. Would someone like to make that motion, please? Yeah, I'd like to uh, make a motion to uh, approve the license for underground propane storage as submitted. Second. All right. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 And opposed? Unanimous. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. And 815, my apologies, it's about a minute late. Uh, we have another posted public hearing. This is an amended license for underground storage for the Hopkinton Country Club at 204 Saddle Hill Road. Pursuant to Mass General Law, Chapter 148, Section 13, the Board of Selectmen will hold a public hearing relative to an application by Joanne Parks on behalf of Hoppington Country Club, Rebel Hill, LLC, of 204 Saddle Hill Road to amend its license to increase the amount of gas to be stored underground from a total of 4,000 gallons of liquid propane gas to 4,500 gallons of liquid propane gas in underground containers at the following locations on the property, three 1,000 gallons at the clubhouse, one 1,000 gallon at the pool, one 500 gallon at the cell tower. Fire chief has approved the required permit. And I will request a motion to open the public hearing. So moved. Second. Moved and seconded. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Welcome. Thank you. And again, you seem to have, looking at the permitting team comments, everybody's blessings, including the most important guy right back there. But um, maybe you'll give us a quick uh, quick rundown of what your plans are. Sure, it's um, similar to the last hearing that you just heard. Mm -hmm. It's the addition of a 500 gallon underground tank for the cell tower. All the other permits have been approved in the past. This was an addition to that. Okay. And so it's really only the 500 that we're really talking about. That's the amendment, correct? That's the added, yeah. yeah. Chief? No, as stated, yeah, um, we're just, we've been reviewing, 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 and these are probably the last two that have caught our eye, and it's all in order. Go. Very happy with it. Excellent. Questions from the board? I have none. Uh, just a couple little things. So the, the tank is to power the cell tower? That's correct. Okay. And um, I was looking at the was it the uh, the maintenance shop it's showing that you have a 350 gallon waste oil tank. Um, what are we doing with so much oil? I'm sorry. What, are you guys burning the oil, or what's the uh, what's going on with that? Well, we actually collect the oil when we repair all of our equipment. Okay. It's a holding tank. No. Oh, okay. Yep, and gets picked up and gets and sold off. Yep. Okay. That's it. Okay. Any comments or questions from the public? I did it right this time. Okay. So, so Miss Wright, I will say on the record that I have been a member at this club for 10, 12 years, and uh, they do everything very top notch. They're very much by the book. Uh, I don't know if I need to recuse myself from this because I'm a member, if, if I need to recuse myself from the vote or not, but I'm speaking as a public and not as a selectman that they're, they're, a, a very, they're a great asset to the community. Do you think, Mr. Kamala, he should recuse? He doesn't have a financial yeah. interest. Yeah, you don't have a financial interest. No? Okay. 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 All right, hearing no other, is there a motion to close the public hearing? So moved. Second. All right, all those in favor of closing the public hearing, please say aye. 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 And opposed, that is unanimous. And I will now request a motion to approve the license for underground storage of liquid propane gas as submitted um, by Hopkinton Country Club. So moved again. Second. Moved and seconded. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 <coughs> Opposed? That is unanimous. Thank you very much. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Chief. Boy, Madam Chair, you get us right back on the schedule. <laughs> nice job. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And now we're 
we're running free here. No more no public hearings. Okay. That's the hard part. FY20, comprehensive budget and capital budget hearing. The Board of Selectmen will adopt the FY20 comprehensive operating and capital budget to be forwarded to the Appropriations Committee. Um, so, Mr. Kamalo, you forwarded to us some suggested changes which look like they will increase the amount of excess levy up to 893000 um, and generate about 300 plus thousand in savings by finding some of these requested items in other areas of the budget. Um, actually, why don't you summarize that for the public rather than me? Yeah, thank you. Um, in, in fact, with the Chair's permission, um, let me share some remarks. Uh, there have been some changes uh, since I sent that memo to, to the Board on Friday. Uh, and also, with the Chair's permission, uh, I would like to invite uh, Tim O'Leary uh, and Ben Swim uh, to, 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 join, to join us up front here, uh, because after my, uh, my remarks, I would like Ben to walk the board through um, our representation of the tax impact information. You recall that on January 28th, um, with the combined efforts of different town boards as well as department heads, I presented an 81.4 million budget calling for 6.4 million in additional spending to account for inflation, modest salary increases, and a small number of new initiatives specifically initiatives uh, designed to address growth in the community. 1.9 million was proposed from state aid and receipts, other than property tax, leaving approximately 4.4 million to be raised from new property tax sources. I want to underscore new property tax sources. Uh, in the weeks since then, I have listened carefully to the board's uh, feedback on the proposed FY20 budget. I have heard loud and clear the board's message regarding maintaining a modest tax impact increase. Mr. Hare specifically looking for a tax impact net of new growth no greater than uh, 2.5 percent. And again, through the collaborative efforts uh, of my office, as well as working with department heads and our colleagues uh, from the school department, I have recommended several reductions from that level, including a reduction in expected employee health care costs, a modest reduction in the road paving program, uh, an early purchase of the Hopkinton Day expenses and the shift of the three police cruiser acquisitions from the operating budget to the pay-as-you-go funding. <coughs> In addition, I should mention, uh, the school superintendent uh, is engaging her team as well as the school, school committee to see if there are any additional uh, reductions that could be offered. This morning, we got some unexpected news. Namely, our bill for KIF Tech will rise by 142,000, above our working estimate of 16,000. Again, the increase is 142,000, above our projected increase of only 16,16. Uh, this is due to the rising enrollment of our students at KIF Tech. I have asked the, school, uh, this, this, the, the superintendent at Kiftech to provide a detailed 
um, outline of our, assess uh, our assessment, uh, that development requires some additional adjustment. And take note, I am proposing that we back off our planned contribution to OPEB by 100,000, dropping back to last year's contribution level of 400,000, and dropping our contribution to the stabilization fund by 42,000, uh, leaving an addition uh, this year of 166,000, mm -hmm. which still leaves us with about, uh, I think, a reasonable increase to the fund. As you know, we're trying to get closer to our 5% mark uh, of the operating budget. Um, as you have noted in my prior budget discussions, I am a strong advocate for funding both these areas. Uh, but our commitment to our shared vocational education program is a dominant concern. With these increases, now combining the increases we, proj we, I, we projected in the memo that I shared with the, with the board and the increases and adjustments um, that I just discussed in response to the key tech numbers, our new increased need is four million, which is 452,000 below the increase I recommended in January, reflecting the many discussions about impact on the taxpayer. Under this revised plan, new growth will contribute an estimated two million of the more four million dollars needed, and the existing taxpayer base would fund the other two million consisting of 1.6 million from our statutory 2.5% rise limit, and an additional 500,000 from a net of drawdowns of unused levy and the payoff of some excluded debt. I know Mr. Hare has emphasized that we not touch the excess levy, but given the news from KIFTEC and the adjustments that we have already made, it's almost impossible not to not touch the excess levy. The combined impact on the existing taxpayer from this series of changes is 2.92%. However, the excess levy number remains is the same as I stated in my memo to the board. We talk about tax impact a great deal. And I think when I presented the budget, I did mention um, the effort that has gone into better understanding how to represent that information to the public and to the board. At this moment, with your permission, uh, may I have Ben Sweeney walk us through the mathematical representations that we have come up with in explaining this concept. And if I may ask, um, because these numbers that you just presented are, are new to us, mm -hmm. could you put those in writing in a memo to the board and to the meeting so we have those? Yeah. Yes, we will. Yes, we will. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, through the chair, uh, thank you for the opportunity to come to speak to this board today. Uh, we continue to evaluate our existing financial communications and whether they are as transparent, as clear as they can possibly be. In that light, upon review of the tax increase summary schedule, which is page four in your packet, we became concerned that based on a method of calculation, incomplete conclusions could be drawn by this board and the public. I'm here today to explain what those differences are to ensure that any ancillary conclusions drawn from this data can be as clear and complete as possible. First, I'd like to highlight that the method used in the calculation of the tax impact that have been previously presented to the board are consistent with the methods used in the FY19 calculations as part of the budget hearings from last year. Secondly, to summarize, the tax impact, tax impact summary schedule is an accumulation of key figures that are reviewed by the Massachusetts Department of Revenue. Those figures are the prior year unused tax levy, the allowable statutory 2.5% increase, new growth, debt exclusions, the unused levy. 
Since our communication to the board, as Mr. Kamala mentioned last Friday, there have been no changes to the total proposed tax levy. What is different from our previous communications to the board is the way we're presenting the percentage change computations. The underlying calculation of the aggregate totals are based on several complex formulas using various data sets. Last year, the presentation of the percentages was added in an effort to show the impact to the average taxpayer on a high level in an easily understood format. Unfortunately, because the aggregate totals were derived from different sources, multiple denominators were used to develop the percentage year-over-year -year change. Our concern, while that what was presented previously was mathematically and logically accurate, we believe there may be a better way to answer the question, what is the tax impact net of new growth? We've updated the tax impact summary schedule by removing some of the distracting percentage changes. We now use the consistent denominator for three aggregate totals. The total tax levy for the existing taxpayers, the total levy for new growth, and the total increase in the tax levy. When using the phrase, what is the impact net of new growth, the correct number would be total tax levy for existing taxpayers in this new format. So, so we've been just want to be sure that board members are looking at page four. Yeah. Yeah. Can I just ask for a point of clarification? Now, when we're talking about this change in tax levy to existing taxpayers, now, does this include the, re the, the reval that was done this past year? Yes. Yes. Okay. Because, because this is one of the things that, that, that to, to me, was conf confusing because here people are, people are thinking they're paying 1717, which we, everybody was paying, but their home values all went up. So before we even start talking about the 2.5% the or 3% or going to excess levy capacity, we've already hit our taxpayers because of their, most of their homes' values have gone up. This is what we talked about the last time. And this is what's disconcerting to me is that uh, here we're talking about hitting excess levy capacity and all of this stuff, and but we've already um, we're already taxing our taxpayers more because their home values have gone up, and they don't see that unless they go and sell their homes, and then they're not part of Hopkinton anymore. Yes, sir, that's exactly correct. And uh, but the way it works in the two-part system, and I think you're dialed right in on this, is that. They'll see it in the evaluation go up more than they'll see it in the tax rate change. But they're going to see an average of 2.92%. And of course, that average is, a, is an arithmetic mean. There will be people who see less, there will be people who see more of a, of a rise based on whether two bedroom condos are hot, or four bedroom houses on three acre lots are hot, or the middle of the market is hot. Uh, and, and what that does to value. But you're absolutely right that the valuation is where people will see the change. The tax rate won't vary that much. Well, so it's about the, about the amount that each taxpayer will have to pay. The check they write will go up by both of those. No, but well, in a, you know, it'll, it's a, it's a uh, combined effect right. of 2.9. So they're not going to get a 2.9 hit on the assessment and then a tax rate rise, it all morphs together and gets resolved at the setting of the tax rate. Right. It's a one, it's a one stop impact. But this is something we, we won't have next year. We won't have a, re, a major reval and sort of recertification where everything else goes up. So we won't have this extra. So we're doing rolling evaluation. And the assessors visit neighborhoods on a rolling basis, and then they look at segments of the uh, property on a rolling basis. I think this year we're going to focus on cell towers, which is something we haven't looked at in a long time. So that over time we try to get it all. So, uh, but if there were, let's say that uh, uh, Middlesex County continues to boom, as the chair mentioned at the last meeting, and there's a radical rise, then you would see a tax rate reduction. We're just at a point right now where the rise in valuations is not that far off from a normal rise to cover inflation and uh, you know contract and salary adjustments and so forth. Well, it's also influenced by how much you spend. Just matter. Absolutely. If, if, you sp if your spending stayed even and your valuation went up, 
your tax rate would actually go down because you'd be spending about money, about one more, but there's <laughs> but it's never go down. So that's and why that's what I expect. control it. And that's because exactly what I expected to see when the valuations all went up. I said, I said, oh, okay, so we're going to be able to lower taxes this year. If the valuations went up by 10%, you would be lowering the tax rates, but you still wouldn't be lowering these taxes. You would just have a different formula. Right, exactly. But it would, but the rate would, rate would go down. Yes. Yes, and but we're going up and we're going up. Because we're, yes. yes. And if the valuations were going up and the rates were going up, we'd be way... To, to your question, though, about the valuation, so once upon a time, was it like a five-year period and they did valuations every five years? Did, am I imagining five no, years? No, that, that was the last time I worked in municipal government before my military <coughs> career, before my uh, federal career. They were periodic, and the shocks were upset the whole community. And at some point in the last two decades, the Department of Revenue started recommending more normalized rolling evaluation adjustments, the use of statistical models in, in interim years. And, uh, it, would, it would be worth having a session where we really discuss the, the uh, assessment process, yeah. which is designed to yeah. smooth out these impacts. Over but this was a certification year, though. This and that's why, and that's why they they, they looked a little bit uh, a little bit closer, and that's why stuff went up a little yeah, bit more. I'm than seeing normal. I remember the assessors board showing me three years, so maybe it was every three. But so now you said we're doing rolling assessments. So if your property gets reevaluated, re how much? T how long are you safe for until they come again? I mean, can you assume that they're not going to come back for another two? I mean, is there, could it be next year, Mary, you're shaking your head? I have to tell you, I, I am just beginning to re-emerge into this world, and I understand that it's a rolling basis. I know my parents used to be safe for 10 years between yeah. assessments. And it would be that right after the assessment, it was time to buy the house and get some new appliances. You knew you were locked in for a while. And that was considered unfair to newcomers and to people who did full permits and did improvements because everyone else lagged for a long period of time and they got upgraded. So, mm. so. so you don't, we don't know what rolling means in terms of when I they come or when they roll around <laughs> again. Uh, <laughs> I, uh, Mary Jo is waving her hand. Can you tell us well, what the answer to well, that is, Mary Jo? It's, it's not quite working like that anymore. Yeah. Um, we do adjust the market annually. Mm -hmm. And that, that takes some of it off. The, the state certifies it periodically, but we do, do kind of try to keep up with it as much as possible. The assessments do run a year and a half behind the market, though, because you have to have that full year of deeds yeah. in order, in order to, to do it. But they, we do adjust every year. And as far as inspections go, they're cyclical now. So they're, that's why we have the assistant to the assessor uh, who goes out all the time doing inspections for the next cyclical. So um, it's, that's just a matter of the Department of Revenue coming in and certifying the values that we are constantly working on and changing. So, but usually when the values go up, the rate We'll go down. I, I know I used to do the, the recap sheet on occasion. It hasn't been lately because the rate is done by the amount of money the tax spends at town meeting. Right. When you look at the recap the sheet or the, the amount the town needs to operate from what they spend, if you look at the recap sheet, every single penny the town has to spend is uh, attributed to on that. And the state goes through it and we get a rate. The, the values is only how the rate is spread around. So because the values went up this time and the rate stayed the same, it means we were spending more. And that's the, that's the bottom line. You have to not spend to get the rate. My up. point exactly. <laughs> I know. <laughs> uh, I didn't mean to put it. But thank, <laughs> thank, you, thank you for that extra information. <laughs> so, so it's a statistical matter, that, as, as you said, in, in the interim years, and then rolling physical assessments. And, and that's the method to try to not have lags 
that are unfair to some people and benefit some mm -hmm. people. Mm -hmm. I think that's the idea of the idea. And, and uh, you know, with many contract agreements in place for employees with contract raises and with inflation and the cost of fuel and goods, and, I mean, to think that we're going to spend the same year to year without reducing services is, yeah. is yeah. a difficult math. I don't know if I'm... So when you throw the, the increase in fuel, fuel's gone down a buck a gallon over the last year, so you can't, you can't throw that in there. Um, the... Um, you know, the, a lot of people in town, I'm not saying that I do or don't agree, but they say it's a shell game where, like Mr. Catino said, your tax rate may stay the same or may go down, but they're going to add fifty, seventy-five thousand dollars to your house. So at the end of the year, your 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 net three or four, five, six, eight hundred dollars more, uh, where they're saying that the tax rate goes up. And one of the one of the the, the um, the demographics that I'm very keen on are the seniors in town, and, and uh, when you get the phone calls or the or the chance run-ins with some of the seniors in town that are saying this is supposed to be this, and they're evaluating my house now at net seventy-five thousand dollars more, so I'm spending spending you know X amount of dollars more. They just don't have it. And it's uh, it's very frustrating for me to see um, stuff like that. When, but here, we're here now to kind of spend less. So let's we get the knife out and let's uh, let's start cutting. When B. McMullen catches you walking out of church, B. McMullen is the least of my problems. <laughs> Primary Harrington. <laughs> oh yeah, <laughs> yes, that's a good catch. You're absolutely right. Okay. So uh, again, I, I thought it was important for the finance team, um, and I should not acknowledge Dave Naltaj and the accountant. He's here. Uh, he's been an integral part in really looking closely at how we represent this information to the public. So before today, before we came up to this meeting, mm -hmm. where we thought that we were going to spend net $16,000, then we find out we're plus 142000 at Keefe Tech. Uh, we were very close to that 2.5%. Mm -hmm. We were at, I believe, 2.72%. So <clears throat> with that 140, it puts us up at the 2.9. So we're just going to have to be a little bit more creative to get to that 2.5. Yes. <laughs> I, I always say that uh, this is a long process until town meeting. Uh, we will continue to look at the numbers as they come in. We did hear from our state representatives today that um, they are now working on uh, moving the state budget process forward and hopefully, hopefully, um, the numbers coming from the House and the Senate will be more uh, beneficial to this community than the numbers we've seen so far. Um, so I haven't, now we haven't had a chance to look over the new things that were just presented to us tonight. Um, looking based on what had been sent out a couple days ago, mm -hmm. recalculating. So with that sources and uses document that we had, um, I was seeing um, that some of the income now was taking 700, I'm looking at the old sheet that we had from March 1st, was taking $750,000 out of the stabilization fund which hadn't happened before. It wasn't, it wasn't, that wasn't in the sources and uses document that we had at the end of January. <coughs> um, 
and I and I kind of worried about that. It looked it looked to me. I don't know if I'm reading this wrong. It looked to me like part of the way we were adding. Uh, I know Mr. Hur really wanted to increase the unused levy, so in, we were sort of backfilling that with taking out three quarters of a million from the stabilization fund, which was that seemed to be pretty much the 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 number that made the whole revised budget as of March 1st work. And I was worried about the, uh, and, and I don't know what the numbers are in the new budget, but I was, if, I, if I'm looking at that right, I was a little concerned just philosophically. It seemed that we are trying to not use, you know, build up our excess levy or not use that levy capacity in exchange for taking the money out of our rainy day fund? In, in fact, the budget does not propose appropriating any money from the reserve fund. Instead, the budget initially was putting more into the rainy day fund. However, based on changes that we've discussed, we're now putting less into the rainy day fund. Again, the budget does not propose appropriating from the stabilization fund. Well, okay, if I, I'm going to just have to look at, be working with the one we had as of March 1st, because I just haven't had time to look at these, but, but in that, the top part, the top set of numbers are the, is the, are the income numbers, and it comes from 2.5%, new growth, blah, blah, and then it says stabilization fund, $750,000. So that looks to me like that's an income source on our, on our income side, that we're taking 750 out. Then now at the bottom of that, uh, it shows that we're putting uh, 250 transferring it into stabilization. So we're t taking out 750, putting in 250 back into our fund that we just took out from, which ends up basically reducing the overall fund by 500,000 in order to accommodate the um, leading more money in the excess levy. That That's what I'm looking at on, on that. And it looks to me like The Mass Department of Revenue recommends that communities have about 5% of their annual budget be stabilization fund. And I think last year we were at 4.2, so if now we're dropping it by 500,000 and our trajectory is for, you know, increasing budgets and decreased new growth, it just, I don't know if I'm reading this wrong, but it's looking to me like we're, we're, dependent, we're deciding to dip into our rainy day fund to fill, to backfill our expense needs, which is not a real good policy unless you're, if it's a one-time problem, but if your trajectory is downward for income, that's a dangerous, that's a dangerous route. Through the chair, absolutely. If we were doing that, that would, that would not be the way to go. To explain, the top part of the sources and uses uses document where you see that 750,000. Yep. That's clearly identifying the sources that we have. I think what this thing doesn't say is that the $750,000 that we were looking at was coming from free cash. That, that yeah, not from stabilization. It's coming from free cash. Stabilization goes up, Madam Chair. So we had about, I think we had like 3.2 in th certified free cash, but then by the time you took out the other obligations, it was like 2.3 that was available for other uses. So was that 750 in that, in that 3.2? Through the chair, if you refer to page three, it has a detail of um, yeah. the free cash. Is it included right. in there? So right. Just, no, that's what I'm looking at. Maybe I'm getting too into the weeds. I just I spent a lot of time with this, and it just looked to me like we were we were borrowing from Peter to pay Paul, which worried me. I have too many pieces of paper here, and I can't find what I want. Again, apologies for the late 
change. Yeah. Uh, we would try to get the deals working yeah. with the cost uh, increase. Uh, So can you explain to me on free cash, on page three, it says the free cash, this is what was certified, was 3.2. Mm -hmm. And then after time, after you take out these other things that are um, already encumbered, like snow and ice and budgets, uh, you know, prayer year bills, it left balance available for FY 2020 of roughly 2.3 million. So are you saying that 750 for the stabilization is, is in one of these free cash numbers here? Through the chair below that, um, under FY 2020 appropriations, there's capital pay as you go of, of 1.6 yeah. million, and then listed the stabilization fund and the, the OPEB trust, and that is the source on, on the top part of that of the sources and uses spreadsheet. Through the chair, please. So are there opportunities to fund OPEB and general stabilization fund less than proposed? Freeing up free cash, and uh, if so, can the freed up free cash, freed up free cash, be used to offset the tax impact? Yeah. In 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 fact, um, that's one of the the approaches we've used. Um, the information that I shared with you identifies instances where we are moving items from being funded through taxation to being funded through free cash. How do we get that free cash? We got that free cash by downsizing our investments in OPEB and in the stabilization fund. So the three police cruisers that will move the operating budget mm -hmm. to the PAYGO is an example of that. Where we no. scour every line of the budget and the school scour every line look for things that were truly one-time needs mm -hmm. this year that were being included in the recurring base, Madam Chair. So f what makes up free cash, by and large, is funds that are budgeted and are left at the end of the budget year. Yes. And those get certified. And then we take that free cash and we spend it on other stuff. But those, we have those overages because the budgets are obviously an estimate. They're not down to the penny. But like last year we had, what, 3.2 million in certified free cash. Doesn't this raise the question that a lot of these budget items could be cut back? If we're coming up with 3.2 million free cash, couldn't we cut that back and cut it a little closer to the bone and probably still come out all right? And at the end of the year, if one area is a little short, you can encumber it from funds that are in excess in another area rather than putting it all into free cash and then the next year, it's like candy land, we'll go spend it on something. Why don't we find a way to spend less in the budget year by cutting those numbers back? So they don't wind up in free cash. We don't, we don't spend it and it keeps our budget down. Yeah, that's another exciting observation. <laughs> exciting. Yeah, free cash, from my perspective, there are two key contributors to free cash. One is the conservative approach to our budget projections. Local we project conserv conservatively, and in the past years, our receipts come in higher than what we project. Particularly with local receipts. It, yes. Said. So that's, that contributes substantially to the free cash. Yeah. Let's talk about the budgets. The free cash resulting at the end of the budget here is not by accident. Mm -hmm. It's through a conscious effort to manage spend. That's why we hire the bench swings of this world, to make sure that although town meeting has approved the budget, we don't just go spend widely. 
what we do is that we measure every spend. And also, remember, we don't spend because we have the money. We spend because there's an ultimate need for. And so, there are items that town agencies go ahead and purchase this, and we don't. Mm -hmm. For example, in the town manager's budget, we have money to replace Jamie. We have not. That was one of the contributors uh, to our free cash. And there are many departments that do that. And also in instances where we have vacancies, at times it takes longer to fill a vacancy. There's one vacancy that we just filled after 18 months, the recycling attendant. So, the part of the answer to, is this excess money? The answer is no. We control spend, which is good. And then the second piece to it is that I like the fact that the community has two opportunities to decide how this money is used. At the time the budget is constructed, and at the time we come to discuss free cash, it's through this process where the community still decides how the money is used. So for me, I would rather be, I would rather have this problem than not have it. Mm -hmm. That's, that's. I would just say working in several organizations, Madam Chair, where in government, typically 80% of your expenses are payroll that lapses in hiring and slow hiring and challenges in filling positions account for substantial amounts. So Absolutely. I've seen organizations choose to budget at 94% of payroll or 96% of payroll and hope they have that lapse, but the town has been more conservative and they budget at payroll as if we have a full workforce. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And that's a substantial contributor to the free cash. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's, it's, it's a conservative way to go. Sure. Yeah. yeah. I can see both sides. I mean, certainly, it's, it's, it's good management of your budget, of, of your funds that you have, but it does still beg the question, could, could we shave things off on the other end and lower the overall budget and not have as much free cash at the end, which goes to something else? Um, um, and, and reduce your overall budget. Madam Chair, if, you, if I could. Okay. Um, so uh, th th this isn't an arbitrary thing that we do, um, it, and I can present this to you. I actually had to present it in um, my previous employment. Um, the DOR recommends a 5% return over your operating budget be free cash, what your free cash should be, mm -hmm. okay? So, you know, as we, you, we've talked about this, the stabilization fund being at 5% yeah. and, and all those things, the DOI is actually recommending at the end of your process that you should have, or you should have built in to your process a 5% return to free cash. So by, by going that route, that's why we're, that, that's where um, with the stabilization funds and this free cash, that's what looks attractive to our rating agencies. So therefore, if if we start to do those things mm -hmm. that you spoke spoke of, you know, uh, be a little bit more leaner, mm -hmm. uh, run a little bit more tighten, tightening of the belt, um, that, that could affect our free cash, mm -hmm. which could affect our outlook for the rating agencies. So if we need to go out and get more money and borrow, Mm -hmm. uh, we may have to pay much higher rates mm -hmm. if we lose our, if we lose our, uh, because it's all liquidity now when we're looking out in the, in the marketplace for bond mm -hmm. borrowing. Yeah. So that's what they look for. They look for that strength. Are you also taking care of, you know, those kinds of things that you're building into your budget? And yes, you know, the, the, the local receipts could be a little bit more tight, um, but then, if we have a problem where we, we say, okay, we've made, uh, we've made progress, substantial progress on our um, investment income, and then next year it tanks. Um, so now we have a potential a problem by doing that. So that's why the DOR also forces us when we, we change local receipt values of what we're estimating. Mm -hmm. Anything that has a 5% differential of change you have to explain why you do these things. So they're also looking out for the people's interest also. 
so you know we we want to be we want to be conservative we want to be you know um, we want to to make sure that we're dealing with all the people that may have problems um, but we also have to look at the business end too you know and if we're going to need to go out and borrow we want to have make sure we have our reserves up to mm -hmm. um, the level where um, they'll be considered uh, be reconsidered to approve us at the highest rating follow-up to the chair mm -hmm. so I can understand having having a rainy day fund um, up there for, for bond ratings but wouldn't a, a rating agency be more uh, wouldn't they be happier to lend to somebody that has a tighter budget as opposed to, like you said, a 5%, you know, when we're starting to talk about 5% um, uh, of free cash, that now we're talking like four and a half million. You know, th then it just seems like that you're missing your budget by a lot right there, you know, and, and for year, over, year after year. And, and, and if, if you held your budget tighter, then that two and a half percent that you're going up the next year is it's a little bit closer, you know. So so you've got your two and a half percent plus your free cash. It, it just somewhat seems like uh, people say a shell game kind of a thing. It's like, well, wait a minute. Why don't we bring it in tighter so the free cash comes in at like a million, a million and a half, so that a so that when the people see the taxes go up two and a half percent, it's a true two and a half percent. It's not using leftover from last year plus the two and a half percent plus the excess levy capacity plus we're not going to put as much away, you know. And then it, it's it's harder. It ends up looking like this for the for the for the average taxpayer. It's like oh, so which line are we talking about? You know, it's you know. So here I am. This is my sixth we're, year up here, and, and it's uh, Madam, Madam Chair, sir. We're, we are working to try to make uh, what is a pretty complex system with multiple sources uh, clear and we're going to continue to work to make it more clear and that's why we've tried to be really upfront Thanks. and say this is a three two point nine two percent increase to the to the existing taxpayer base with this plan and you certainly can adjust this plan uh, I, I think the attractive thing about reducing <coughs> the free cash is you can do it one time and you could drop it from three million to a million and a half and sharpen your pencil and tighten it up but next year it's a million and a half so you would buy you a one-time improvement and it would loosen it would lessen your flexibility in the out years so if we have a really bad outcome a really expensive event a terrible snow season or other terrible problems we have many levers we can use with this level of budgetary flexibility to address them, including adjusting the free cash level, the reserve levels, uh, and then slowing procurements during the year, slowing hiring. There are many, many levers for us to make sure we never bust the budget. And if we tighten it beyond what DOR recommends on that rainy year, not just a rainy day, we would just have that much less flexibility. So, uh, I mean, there's, it's a uh, I'm a fan of very tight budgeting, and for projects especially, uh, but it seems like there's so many variables in the operating budget of the community that the state has prescribed this approach and we're trying to follow it. Yeah. The chair? Mr. Nisrell, please. So, um, I certainly don't want to pay more. <laughs> and I think that's kind of the expression from all of us. And as we're all trying to follow along, we all see that there is uh, various pools that we can dip into, whether it be excess real uh, free cash, excess levy, what have you. Um, I think with the excess levy, we all understand that, that that's something that we're paying. But I think this is something unusual for the average person. Because typically, you look at how much money do I have, and you adjust your spending accordingly. Here, we'd say, how much money are we going to get? Uh, and then and, and, and how much money are we going to spend? And then we raise it, right? right. right? So it's backwards. Um, so be it. I'm, I'm new here, and I'm new to uh, municipal. That's no, that's the way it works. That's the right question. Exactly right. 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 So, um, as far as, you know, kind of uh, being conservative fiscally, 
I think it does make sense to have the free cash um, on a consistent basis because, and, and this is just my thoughts on it, is that what happens if we try to tighten up our budget and we don't have, and, and then let's say the numbers don't come in where we expect and they come in far worse, then where are we? And then we're into borrowing and then we're into new debts and do we want to go there? So, um, I mean, I think you've done a great job in putting, putting this together. I don't want to spend any more money. <laughs> um, and, and knowing that my, my value has gone up as well as my rates, <sighs> getting hit from both ends. Um, so I guess we need to spend less. <laughs> yeah, I, I, you know, th through the chair, see, but, you know, we, we talk about, you know, something big hitting or something like that, and, and, I'm, and I'm looking, you know, or, or we're not going to have the, the numbers coming in. I'm just looking over the last uh, 17 years, and we've we've got, we're, we're, we're here. I don't, I don't see any. You know, even at uh, looking at uh, 08 and 09 when the, the world, uh, to maybe 2010, we went down a little bit. But that's uh, we, we've we've pretty, pretty much going up. Sir, that's a valuation chart you're looking at. The, yeah. the values that you got from the assessor. Mm -hmm. I don't think everyone has that copy, but yeah. but it shows. It shows a steady climb in valuations, no question. It, to, to, be, please. to be clear, I've been in this town since 2009. Most of those years, the town taxed below prop two and a half. Yeah. With excess levy. Mm -hmm. And we're too high it. I just want to mention that. Yeah. No, 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 I understand yeah. that. Right, yeah. 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 And, and so growth is in, is in those sheets that you have. Mm -hmm. That reflects not just the base, but it reflects the growth that's been, as somebody who's buying a house Friday, I can tell you the growth here has been remarkable. So, mm -hmm. so could I ask what the projected excess levy would be in the outlying years? Yes. Based on the numbers I shared with you, and this is in your document um, on page one, uh, we project in 2021 um, a surplus of 415,227, and then in 2022, it's also around 442,000. Again, uh, <coughs> If the budget moved forward as presented tonight, uh, including the adjustments we identified, uh, the excess levy will be around 800 and... 93? It's 893,000. So, I don't know if this goes to Norman or to Tim, but what measures can the town take to reduce the overall tax impact uh, net of new growth to 2.5%? I think that goes from the boss. <laughs> Stop <laughs> spending. <laughs> so he's, last yeah, year, he's, this, he's, this was what I was doing last year, and I got beaten yeah. for it. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, again, I think that's another good question. As I explained earlier, part of the driver behind the budget growth are the initiatives proposed to address the growth in the community, additional teachers, additional firemen, um, additional police officers, additional staff in the HR department, increased library hours. If we were going to continue to downsize the budget, those are the things we will not tend to. Uh, sir, right now that you've said that, part <coughs> Thank you for saying that, Madam Chair. Sir, I would say in the long run, uh, a, a big piece of our operating budget is our debt service. And we're, I'm, I'm just starting to look at our debt service. And so we have a certain trajectory for servicing debt and for recapitalizing assets. And we have a normal level of debt service that we're covering now. Uh, over the long run, we could look at the tempo of capital replacement and uh, achieve some stabilization that way, but uh, there's been a lot of 
enthusiasm and support for rapid recapitalization. And so those debt services associated with that recapitalization come home to roost in the budget every year. Mm -hmm. So I think having a longer term, meaningful discussion about the tempo of recapitalization is part of this equation you're struggling with year to year. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's not something we can turn on a dime. Uh, it's an oil tanker, not a speedboat. So thinking about that recapitalization is a, a long-term opportunity, a two to three year opportunity for us to think about how those trend lines go out in the future. It's, it's the big non-personnel expense. Mm -hmm. So in terms of making this understand, you know, at, at the end of the day, the people that are watching at home, they want to know what's going to cost me when I get my tax bill. Um, and sometimes I get a little bit confused, I will admit, by the different percentages and what they actually mean. Um, I did finance. It, took it in business school, I hated it, so <laughs> it's not my strength. Um, but I know last year in an attempt to try to make things understandable, some of this impact was expressed in a dollar amount, like it means it's going to be an increase on the average tax bill of like $683. I remember we put a dollar figure on it. It seemed to be understandable. I think it may have created more confusion because people's tax bills were they, that's what they were expecting, and it was more than that. So can you just tell me and, and people in plain terms, when we talk about a 2.92% tax impact, can you give people a dollar sense of what they, that would mean to them? Is this a 2.92% rise over their previous year's tax bill? Is that how they can yes, calculate that? Yes, on average. So I was just trying to do the so, typical $659,000 median home, which is right. even an average. It's just the, the middle house in the market okay. that sells. And then to think about what 2.92% would be on that uh, at the 1717 rate. And I, I uh, wasn't able to do it with my pen but, because I was listening to you. But, but basically that's what they can do. They, can t they could look at last year's tax bill. And increase in where's the number out? Uh, yeah, so uh, I can. Yeah, so uh, is it three is that the three hundred and seven? Yeah, so Madam Chairman, a, a approximate increase for a, a home of value of approximately six hundred thousand dollars would be an increase of approximately three hundred ten dollars. <throat> would so be a two point nine percent increase. No, yeah, right. It just sounds a little yeah, low because I just paid my escrow for my <laughs> tax bill. For my closing yeah, Friday, so, and we can, so we can. Uh, so they take their previous year's tax bill and how, and how do they, how would they calculate that? Just just tell me it what be, the process. The, if the be median easy. value is six hundred and fifty nine thousand, and it's seventeen seventeen a thousand yeah. now at the old because you assume that the value is going to go up, yeah. right? So if it's six fifty nine times seventeen seventeen per thousand. And then I would multiply that by 0 0.03 to see what the, or 0 0.292, 0 0.0292, mm -hmm. to see what that rise would be. Is that what you did? So that's your 2.92. And that would tell you that your $10,000 tax bill is going to go up by 3%, which would be, yeah. maybe that's it. Your $10,000 tax bill is going to go up by $300. And that's, again, Rough. you yeah. will never hear from the people whose tax bill goes down or doesn't go up, by, sure. goes up by $2, and everybody under the other end of the bell curve whose goes up by $600 is going to say, why am I above the mean? Yeah. But you never hear from the people who are below the mean. <laughs> so it's a, there's a bell curve distribution, and you always hear from the people yeah. on, the, on the bad tail. Yeah. But I think that's not particularly accurate either okay because if you take because it's not taking into account the the new assessed value right so my 600 or my ten thousand dollar tax bill from last year um, was based on evaluation of X and now it's X plus one right so so I think it does sir uh, madam chair sir I 
because there's three factors, right? There's the tax bill, the valuation, the rate, and then the 2.92% we're talking about. And so you can either increase, assume that that 2.92% increase applies to either the valuation or the tax rate, but it doesn't apply to them both. It just applies to one of them to raise the amount of money that's needed. Mm -hmm. So you could think of it as your valuation stays the same and your rate goes up by 2.92% average, or you could think that your valuation goes up by 2.92% and your rate stays the same. It's just a three element equation. So I think, I think it's in there. So the, uh, yeah, okay, sorry for the chase. So the 2.92 uh, takes into account the increased assessed value. Yes. Yes, sir. Okay. And, and, and there will be people who call you and say, I did not get 2.92%. And that will happen. Yeah. That, that will happen. Oh, so that you mean that average of 2.92%? It's, it's the middle of the bell curve. Okay. Uh -huh. and, and it may be that you own a two-bedroom condo with four and a half baths and a two-car garage, and that's the hottest thing in the market. And that valuation just went up tremendously. And you might have an old rambler uh, in another part of town, and that value didn't change it, uh, at all, or may even have dropped. But the, where I'm confused, though, is then if my $500,000 house was now revalued at $550,000. Right. That would be a 10% rise. So, and, and then you put the, you multiply that by the 2.93%. I went... I, so what I'm expecting my what I'm expecting to pay is 2.93 percent on 500,000, but instead I'm paying 2.93 percent on 550,000. So you're paying, uh, Madam Chair, sir, you're paying 1717, 17 dollars and seventy cents on 500,000, yep. right? Yeah. And then if your 500,000 goes to 550,000, mm -hmm. and then the rate goes up by 2.9 percent, you know, so that's your, that's your rise. The rate will drop or stabilize or stay the same or go up less than it would if you didn't have an increase. Yeah. But doesn't the, so by, but, but if, if we, if, if, when we said when the tax rate is set, it's, so we're going to be going up to, we're, we're, we're assuming maybe 1725? That, 1723? Yeah. That was our projection. We've actually slashed some off this budget since then. So, so then I'm paying 1723 on 550,000. So, so my, my point is, as much as it's a three level, it, it, it is an equation with, with three factors in it, it's, I, I, I'm paying. I'm paying. Ex, I'm paying more. I'm paying tax on another fifty thousand dollars. Yes, and, and and if you're, if if that fifty was right at the mean, and everybody had just the mean rise, if the, if the statistical program the assessors use gave everybody exactly the same rise, a peanut butter spread approach, then the rate and if. The amount we were raising was the same as the two and a half. Just miraculously, the rate would stay the same. That would be the math. You'd get right. the same rate, but you'd still pay more because your assessment went up. Mm -hmm. If the if the town meeting determines a need higher than the two and a half percent, more money than that will be raised. So even if your house stays the same or everybody's goes up that same amount, there will be a delta in the tax rate. So, so, so to the chair, but, but my point is, when we look at the new growth numbers of $3 million, yes. and then we look at the, 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 the revals done, right. many people will look, look at us, the Board of Selectmen, and say, why aren't my taxes going down? Why are we spending so much more than the new growth number of $3 million, plus the, re, the, re, the reval, why are we spending that much more? And I know that that's it's, it's on us to, 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 to try and cut in, budgets. In fact, through the, through the chair, you're absolutely correct, Mr. Cortina. The spending is determined by the budget. Okay. And I think the other issue that we're discussing, which 
I believe we have no control over is the results of the market forces. Evaluation. Yes, and the value of real estate here in Hopkinton. Um, we, we can discuss this issue as much as, as we want, but we really have no control over the market forces. There were also comments made regarding our, our free cash. Let me take this opportunity through the chair to refresh the public on, on why the town has a triple A rating. Number one, it's the strong economy. Mm -hmm. Number two, is our strong budgetary performance. Mm -hmm. And part of that budgetary performance relates to our surpluses. We have strong surpluses through free cash. We also have good st strong management, which is what is at play here this kind of dialogue that the board has leading to better financial policies. Also budgetary flexibility, and that can only happen if we have available fund balances. Our fund balances have been strong. Also, very strong liquidity. Um, we have had right around 15 to 16 percent of available cash. Uh, is, is a business operation, and that's always good. And then finally, we, we have a very good and strong debt and contingent, contingent liability profile, which again I think is a play here. We hear the CFO talking about our long-term debt, debt profile. This is something that the town has paid attention to. I'm reminded of Ron Eldridge's chart with the graph almost touching the ceiling. So I just wanted to refresh the public as to why free cash is an important component of our physical health and how it relates to our credit rating and what are the other factors that are considered when the town is rated. So do the chair one more thing. So God forbid we don't have any more new growth. Yes. Okay, because that's one of the things you know, that I, I'm noticing that that's we're going to probably talk about that later. So some of these new, some of these uh, warrant articles that have come up to limit growth, and that's one of the scary things about limiting growth, is that this is this is the money that we depend on to pay for these contractual agreements that uh, going on. So, um, so through the chair, I just kind of threw some rough numbers. I mean some some of my rough numbers, I don't know if they're right or not, on that 500 versus 550. So the, the 500,000 at 1717 comes out to 85.85. The 550 at 1717 comes out to 94.43, which is about, I don't know, $62 increase. Uh, but then when you add the 2.93%, that 85.85 goes to 88. 36 versus the 550 goes to 9720, which is, I don't know, almost a thousand bucks. Oh, no, the 2.93 percent, uh, uh, th that was the 50,000. I, I actually did a 10 percent. I actually went up 10 percent. Right. So the 2.93, that was, that was the average. So I, I yep. so, so there's round numbers, but I was, I yeah. was just showing that there's, oh, whatever. Um, so I'm concerned about the proposed tax impact, um, especially how such increase may affect seniors on fixed income. I want all Hopkintonians to continue to afford to live in the community. Uh, I encourage all stakeholders to continue working towards reducing the tax impact down to 2.5%, um, eliminating the need to use excess levy to balance the budget. Um, is it too early or is it a right time to make a motion right now? If, can we make a motion to... I'd like the... Um, I typed it out. Uh, I'd like to make a motion to pass the budget on to the Appropriations Committee with a condition that existing tax base not exceed 2.5% increase and no use of excess levy. Well, I thought that we had to approve one of these budgets that's been submitted. That's been working on by this time. I don't think we can. 
from the agenda, it says we're supposed to approve the budget tonight. We need to get this to appropriation. So I well, we can beat it up. Well, we, no, we, no, we can't. We can beat it up, and that's what Norman's. <laughs> but uh, what number are we? If I make to the chair, what number are we at right now? The tax impact net of new growth is two is two point nine two percent. And we should be using the sources and uses budget basically that's what you distribute tonight. Yes. And that, that also comes along with the detailed individual right. budget. And that sources. includes yeah. that nasty Brand Keith Tech right. 100. It includes it's all the unpleasant surprises that you just got in. So this, these are the new numbers that we would have to basically be approving. Yep. Um. But isn't it a little late to ask appropriations to start? No, no, no. It, 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 it's um, well. I don't know. Okay, so, uh, I'm just holding off on doing a second right now, to, but just because I want to discuss it a little bit. Um, no, it, it, it's we wouldn't be passing over to appropriations. It would actually mean that that uh, that Dorman has to make a lot of phone calls and do a lot of a lot of, a lot of sharpening in order to try and pull out uh, 042 percent. Yeah, because what we passed to appropriations is what we've approved, and then they've got to look at the right. So this is going to be a delay in the not, budget. It's I not can up see to them I to see start to get it down to 2.5. That stops here, pretty much. Right. So it just delays us. Um, right. We're already into March. It delays us getting getting the getting it over to appropriations yeah. before before we get, before we knock it down. And um, so my question to Mr. Kamalo is. Um, do we have to use the 0.42 percent out of excess levy capacity? Is there any other way? Are there any other things that we can do so that we can please Mr. Herr and Mr. Ted Stone and uh, everybody out there? Because I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm almost ready to say I want to retire the other, the, the uh, our present excess levy capacity. So that next year, if we have to do this, we have to ask the taxpayers when we do something. But uh, you know, it's it's good that we have it to make it make this budget process easier. That's why I got really nervous when we were setting the um, bu budget message back in September, and it seemed like um, when we were telling the schools that they could go up six percent and other people five percent and this, I just said, where did all this money come from? Because normally we were starting to say, okay, three percent, three percent, two percent, one percent, and it's almost doubled. Um, is there anything we can do? I'll just stop talking. Okay. Can yeah. I ask? Can you can can figure, you can figure out <laughs> the difference between a two point five and a two point nine percent? I mean, how, what's a dollar amount that we would need to shave off of this budget? Good boy. Great mm -hmm. question. Uh, Madam Chair, we're working on that right now. I want to not give you the wrong number in a public hearing. So we have two separate teams working on that right now. And we'll tell you as soon as we have yeah. a number we all agree on. If that's... I mean, like, I know it's not considered good policy to take free cash and use that to fund operating expenses. Mm -hmm. You're supposed to be able to cover your costs with, with funds you can raise, but it's not it's not in, inadmissible. I mean, you can do it. It's just frowned upon. But I mean, I, like I was looking at the capital expenditures and, you know, out of, out of, um, what was it, out of like a million nine, out of a million nine, Million nine seventy nine in free cash. I'm sorry, but a million one oh six comes out of school department things. I mean, can some stuff come down from those estimates? Can they have less to work with? Can we use some of the free cash? It just, you know, we started out with two point three free cash to work with, and we spent one point nine of it. It's almost all of it. And you know, over half over half is all school stuff, and the schools are the lion's share of the budget to begin with. I'm just wondering, you know, are there are there some things here? There's like 170 thousand for district-wide improvements. Could some of that be reduced? Could we? Um, 
I, I had picked out a whole bunch of different different things here. Um, you know, I look through these. They're all some of them are not such big items, but then when you add it up, all of a sudden, oh my gosh, you're at a million nine. Can we shave some of these down a little bit and get something out of free cash that goes in there? It's one thought. I have a lot of confidence in Mr. Kamalu. I mean, he's he's been magical with the numbers throughout the through my tenure here. Where if sorry, he's always able to he's always able to to find that. And um, I don't know what the what the end number is on this. The 2.92 versus the 2.5, but I know that I have a lot of confidence if we task Mr. Kamala to do that. What the number is? Do it. Uh, uh, Madam Chair, members, the number is 287,000 additional dollars, and it should not be one time money, it should be operating money. Okay, well, okay, so that goes to my earlier question about shaving all the budgets, and I, I understand your point about budgeting in a way that's going to put us in a strong position. But we also had a couple comments here saying, let's tighten it up. Could we not, by looking at that whole budget, I know there's things you can't take away from, you know, employee benefits and contracts, but amongst the things that you could, I mean, we've got, what, an $81 million budget? We can't shave off 200000 not taking it all from you or you, but you know, just a little shave here and a little shave there. And, I, I, you know, it seems to me out of an $81 million budget, we could we could cut things back a little here and a little there and come up with 200000 That's not a huge chunk of money out of $81 million. It would be a little leaner, but should still be, you know. I mean, again, if it's producing $3.2 in excess in free cash at the end of the year, that still says to me that there's, there's some wiggle room in there that would still give you a strong budget. But that's not my profession, so I don't mean to be telling other people, but just... One well, moment, yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Respectfully, um, I'd like to suggest the following to the board. One, that if the board is so inclined, approve the budget as presented and forward it to the Appropriations Committee so that the Appropriations Committee can at least begin its review. Um, the we can go yes. back and make changes as they go through? Um, yes, as we've done in the past, where clearly the, the authors of the budget are the selectmen and the town manager, um, allow the town manager to continue to work with the superintendent. Um, as I reported earlier, the superintendent may be coming back with some suggestions. Uh, we will go back to the department heads as well and see if there are any changes that we, we could propose, uh, and we'll bring them to the board. Uh, as these changes are uh, made known to us. So again, I think this is a two-step process. Move the bu budget forward to the Appropriations Committee as presented with the understanding that the town manager will continue to work with the post superintendent and the department has to identify any additional reductions. Mr. Tedstone, would that satisfy you? And I'll, I'll, I'll accept the, uh, I'll, I'll second it if that's what you want to. Uh, because we really do have to get it to a well, You can't just tell them to find who the chair is. So, Mr. Um, so we do have a, chance, a second bite at the apple here. We can come back and look at where else, sorry, you will be looking at where else can we shave, uh, as, as Madam Chair had suggested. Um, by, by moving this forward, we still can, we can, we can still reduce, right? Correct. I just wanted to add, when I was looking at numbers, it's funny because I, I, I kind of figured we needed about 200000 too. But I was just looking at, at budgets and not, not including, I mean, everybody's got their own numbers, so this may not be right, but not including employee benefits or anything, the, and not including the schools, I figured if all the remaining, the remaining general government, public safety, 
Public Works, Human Services, uh, Cultural, Culture and Recreation. If they shave 2% off their budgets, that would take off about 240000 And if the schools took off one-tenth of 1%, one that would be 48000 Gives you a savings of 2885 and I mean, my, that's just one, you know, just one idea of just a little, a little tiny adjustment that, according to my calculations, comes up with almost 300000 But I don't know. But that's not to be decided now. I was just looking at these figuring, you know, it might not be impossible to do if you took just a little bite here and a little bite there. But So, so rather than accept that amendment, I'd rather have my motion die on the floor. Okay. Well, it wasn't it wasn't seconded. So, so should we perhaps then be making a motion to accept the budget that was presented in the documents dated March fifth? That's the most current that we've got. Correct. What was passed out tonight? Yes. And that is a budget of. Uh, Eighty thousand nine hundred eighty million nine hundred ninety four thousand seven hundred and sixty eight dollars. Seven sixty one. Sixty one. Sorry. The pair of glasses isn't enough. Okay. So I, I, I'll make a motion that we pass on the proposed FY 2020 budget onto Appropriations Committee with the caveat that the 2.92% increase um, be worked down to 2.5% as much as possible. That's a broad stroke. To there's there's no there's nothing to quantify as much as possible. Well, yeah, it, it's try and find two hundred eighty-seven thousand. You've done it before. You've, you've, you you did it uh, four years ago. You did it three years ago. <laughs> Even last year, you came in at the last second, and you had some great changes. You know, I, I, I understand that that um, you know, and we've beat up these, we've beat up this budget, and and I know that uh, that um, public safety is has taken some hits, and you already re moved around the uh, the cruisers and everything else, and we we, we took money out of the roads already. Um, so I know that you that you you really worked it and you got hit hard with that hundred and forty two thousand. If there's something you can look at that with the uh, um, with the Keefe Tech, but um, yeah, to, to to Mr. Ted Stone's point, I I I just couldn't couldn't second it only because I know how tough it is. Last year was I, you know, people were saying that I was firing teachers, um, you know, when we were trying to get it down to three percent, and I and that was it was, it was tough, and um, and I know that that. Uh, that you're gonna that you'll do your best to pull it down. But I think the key is, like you said, firing teachers. You shouldn't all. We shouldn't attempt to take it all from one or two. No, 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 no. That's, no, that's what I'm saying. When that's we were trying to limit the growth spread the cane, year. you probably. You know, well, this is the thing. People think we're yeah. cutting budgets, and instead we're yeah. just trying to limit growth in budgets, in order to and, and because because you know to, to Mr. Ted Stone's point also, you know everybody's home value went up. Right. And we're trying, and we're taxing them on top of that. And so I want to make sure that uh, that the person whose uh, whose house went up fifty thousand dollars doesn't uh, uh, really choke when they open up their tax bill. If if I may, through the chair, uh, may I ask if if I ask him just one question? Does the two point nine two percent include debt exclusions? that the taxpayers have already said they could be taxed on? No, it does not. Oh, it does not, okay. Just wanted to be sure. We found that one two years ago. Yeah. Mm. That was a good catch. Yeah. Um, he, 
he, he's perhaps looking back at the process. Um, when we collectively set the budget message, perhaps we need to be firmer on these guidelines. Um, this is on all of us, where perhaps back then our focus was on the percentage increase um, in the departmental budgets. And perhaps we underestimated the impact, mm. the tax impact. Um, because I think one of the uh, points of discussion with the department says are going to be is going to be around. Well, this is what the budget message said. It did not identify 2.5 as the overall tax impact net of new growth. Um, however, I I do understand where the board is coming from. I understand that this is a charge that is being presented to us. Uh, however, I, I, I still just wanted to talk to the process in general. Uh, that going forward, it, it may be helpful to set these these targets uh, when the budget is is set. I got heat for that last year too. <laughs> but you know. This is well. This is probably a discussion for next year, but I mean, relative to the budget message, you know, we struggled with numbers to pick, and it, it kind of depends on the department. Clearly, the kind of targets we had to give to the schools, considering what they've been facing, is different than what we had to give to other departments. But yet, you know, when you look at the department detail budgets, and there's pages upon pages of them, and you look at the percentage changes, there were some big percentage increases. They weren't anywhere, in, I mean, and there's understandable reasons for them all, but most of these budgets weren't anywhere near the conservative kind of numbers that we talked about in September. Mm -hmm. You know, you've got eight, nine, um, you know, 23, 18%, 29%, I mean, it's all over the place. So I, I guess that cuts both ways. Um, but by and large, I can't say that these departments all tried to stay within anywhere near the kind of numbers that we talked about. Maybe, I, maybe I'm interpreting it wrong. I don't know. I'm just looking at those percentage change numbers that were in the departmental budgets, and they were all, all over the place. Yeah. And in fact, I think the other challenge we face is that the, the distinction between town and school is academic, no pun intended, <laughs> because the bulk of the town budget accounts school. for school expenses. Right. Mm -hmm. So yeah. really the, the apportionment is, is not as precise as, as we would like it to be. But I think, if I do the chair, but I think we have to, and I, I was speaking to the chair of the um, school committee the other day about this, I think that we do have to be more transparent on that, where if the school budget truly is well into the, well into about 70% or 78% or something of the entire budget, you know, the town should know that. And so when we do, when we split stuff up so that, so that the, what it looks like the school budget's going up 7% uh, because we're figuring it at $50 million dollars as opposed to 65 million, and they'd only be going up 3%, and we'd be able to see a little bit more apples to apples. And um, so, to, you know, to, to actually carry the, the personnel expense, or the, 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 you know, the OPEB numbers, and the, and, and the uh, uh, you know, the other, the other expenses that the town carries for, for the town, for the school side. So we know what the cost per pupil truly is, and we can we, and we can budget appropriately. Well, given the hour, I think we can talk a long time about what we should do differently, what we should do next year. But right now, we have to make a decision on what's mm -hmm. on what's in front of us, and it's quarter to ten. So, so I'm going to second uh, Mr. Catino's motion uh, that we forward the March 5th, 2019 budget as shown with a goal or an aspiration of the town manager to see if that he can bring the um, bring the amount of uh, unused levy 
down as much as possible. How about a directive to make every effort? <laughs> <laughs> I think our messages were pretty loud and clear. <laughs> okay, so you seconded it. Elaine, do we have a sense of what the motion says or an attempt we can fix it? So was that an amendment to the motion? Um, I, I was trying to repeat the motion. Okay, so um, the original motion was to forward the budget dated March 5th uh, with the caveat that the 2.9% increase be worked down to 2.5% as much as possible. So I guess it's a friendly amendment with a goal as opposed to a caveat. With a goal of 2.5%? Yes. I'll, I'll accept as that. As much as possible. Okay. So the goal is 2.5%. So let's see, do we have to first vote on the amendment? No, we didn't have that. We didn't. Uh, oh, you just accept it. Okay, you, you accepted it. Okay. Yes. All right. Okay, so the motion has been made and seconded. Okay, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 And opposed? No. Nope. No. Okay, the motion carries by a vote of three to one. All right. All right what else we got? Thank you. Thank you for coming. Thank you, everybody. I, I think this is really helpful to just have this kind of discussion where people can understand or not understand or share the fact that we don't always understand the numbers um, and kind of help us work through it. And I think that further on down when we have time for other agenda items, it really would be good to have one of these sort of tutorials um, on the kind of things that boards need to know and the public needs to understand just in the interest of transparency and, and just understanding the process. Yes, ma'am. Thank you for the chance to be here. Thank you. Thank you. What are the chances that we can do an underwriting? Just uh, make a motion. But we don't. So if I made a motion to pass an underride to go to town meeting, we would vote on that now. Um, I think it's what the board yes, what what the board could do is to task the town manager to report back to the board at this next meeting um, regarding the opportunity for an underwrite. Okay. Could we... Should we make a motion? Oh, yeah. What are you doing? Well, hmm? Is that your motion? Sure. I, I kind of wish this had happened while our financial officer was here to speak to the implications, but he's... Oh, oh, yeah. so bad. <laughs> I thought she left. I thought she left. I'm looking right here. I mean, isn't having a fair amount of excess... Uh, in years when we've done underrides, it's because the excess levy capacity got into the millions, like a huge amount that we felt it was a, it was promised to the taxpayers that even though we could go call that in we wouldn't we would if our if our spending needs got to that level we were obligated to go to the taxpayers and ask but we need a certain amount of levy capacity to demonstrate financial strength that that plays into your bond rating what the agencies look like now the budgets that we had a, a couple weeks ago showing an excess levy capacity of about 400,000 and change. Now it's been bumped up to 800,000. And the latest thing that was at the March 5th, I don't recall what, what it was, but this isn't going into really, I mean, you, I wouldn't think you would want to reduce it into, I mean, when it was down at 400, I think that's getting kind of, kind of low in terms of a cushion that you could draw on. Am I not correct, Tim, that this would not put us in a favorable position when we looked at borrowing? Uh, 
Madam Chair, I think I understand this, but I'm going to ask Dave for, to comment on this because he's actually been through this cycle 10 times and I understand it and he's an expert in it. So Mr. Nell Cajun. Be smart enough to defer to Dave on this question. So, um, because this budget is proposed for, as, as Mr. Kamalo had stated, uh, growth, that it would be if we would be looking at those issues next year, having to fund them if we do an underwrite. How are we going to continue to fund those expansions to handle the growth that's happening in the town? That's what a lot of this budget access for, to say, to use a, a, a thing is involving. That's why so many budgets, the, the aggregate budgets are looking like they're so high because we've we're funding growth right. in, in positions, you know, for all, for a lot of departments. So if we do an underwrite, you're going to jeopardize that, few, that those positions plus future growth by doing the underwrite. And what would removing that excess levy capacity do to our, our financial foundation in the eyes of lending agencies? So, again, it's, it's what they would prefer, and I'm just speaking off, you know, my, my past knowledge in working with them and having to uh, go through the interview process with them to set the rates. Um, so their, their thing is liquidity. What do you have that's liquid in, in things? And that's where stabilization funds, uh, free cash um, goes on. So again, if you're, if you're limiting what we're going to take in or have the ability to take in, um, then this that then you're diminished you're potentially diminishing our, our capacity to have free cash and a liquidable value. Mm -hmm. So uh, I would uh, you know, again it's your it's your decisions that thing, but I think you would be jeopardizing the growth that is being established in this in this presented, uh, presented budget. Yeah. Mr. Kamala. If, if I may, um, I, I think I understand the board's request. I also understand the response from staff, putting the two together. I think it would be fair for us to at least give this some thought prepare a report for the board and then bring it back to the next meeting. At this point, we can simply give you general comments. Um, it would be more helpful for us to have more time to at least prepare a report for the board where you'll understand the pros and the cons for uh, moving forward with an underwrite. So, Mr. Tester, would you be willing to withdraw that motion and allow some information to be assembled and presented so we can actually have a more educated discussion and then you could always make the motion if after we've gathered that we or you continue to feel so inclined so the only problem that I have with withdrawing the motion is at our next I don't know when our next meeting is but March 19th so if it's brought to us at our next meeting is it too late at that point to give this to appropriations or whichever department we need to get this to write up. I just want to make sure that... Oh, are we too late? Yeah. Are we too late already? To, sorry, to the chair. Yeah. Um, no, I, I believe the requirement is 40 days before town meeting to set the ballot questions. Um, I think as the board has discussed this before, really the the article at town meeting is purely for discussion purposes. Um, it's for transparency. Um, the, the legal requirement is that there be a ballot question, and I think ballot questions are set 40 days before the actual vote. So there's still time to do, to do the question. Uh, what I, I, 40 days? Yeah, I 14 think, days? Yeah, I think it's 40. I think it's 40 days before. the. The what I understood to be Mr. Teston's request was that the board authorize town staff to prepare the report. Did I understand your question? Yes. And, and, and present it to the board at your next meeting. 
which we'll be happy to do. I don't feel I'm in any position to take any kind of a vote without it being explored further, because this just got thrown out at, what, 10 minutes to 10? Um, and this, this is a sig significant move if we were to do that. So I, I'm not for or against, but I'd certainly like a little bit more input from people than, <laughs> than I do about this. The motion was made. Um, it was not seconded, unless someone wants to second it. Otherwise, what's the, what's the, what's the motion? The motion was to. Mr. Tetzel, uh, what's your motion? What was my motion? To direct staff to prepare a report on the possibility of an override to be presented at the next Board of Selectmen meeting, which is the 19th. Second. Okay. All right. So the, the motion is to direct staff to prepare a report. Okay. All right. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? That's unanimous. Okay. Um, the last item is the discussion of annual town meeting articles. Uh, let's see. Board will review its own 2019 annual town meeting articles. And we already did uh, Peg Enterprise, Fruit Street Parcel, and Kennel Bylaw at the last meeting. Um, what else? And in fact, through the chair, I, our, our, our intention was to ask the board if the board has any additional questions on those three bylaws, the kennel bylaw, um, the peg access bylaw, and then the Fruit Street article. Didn't we vote to support those last week? I thought we went through those. I don't believe the board took positions. <laughs> I, wasn't, I wasn't here last week, so I'm not sure. Maybe we, so maybe we just discussed it? Yep. I was in Barcelona. Okay. I know you were in Barcelona. Reviewed the draft article. Okay, we just reviewed them. Okay. Okay, so last week we reviewed them, and there were no additional changes at that time, but we didn't take a position. Do we? So are there any further questions on these three that were discussed last week? Or would someone like to make a motion to support the Peg Enterprise Fund article? I wasn't uh, here to review them, oh, so yeah. I'll, I'll, def I'll defer, but uh, I will vote because I, I've gone over them already. But they, were not, they were not in the packet this week, but I had them from yeah. last week's packet. And, and the, it's in last through, week's packet? Yeah, and through the chair. The board does not need to take action today. All we wanted to know is if you have any additional questions. Okay. Oh, okay. Yes. All right, so will we, vote, will we will we take action then at the next meeting on the 19th? Yes. Okay. All right, so... Those three will take action on, and then there were the other ones. There's a whole list here. You had Osmond Overlay Zoning District. Are those those aren't ours? Isn't that Planning That's Board? Planning Board stuff. That's Planning Board. Main Street Quarter Project easements. Yeah, we're, we're still talking with Mastiotti to really decide whether there is need for additional language beyond what was approved last year. Okay. So maybe we'll have more information about that yes. at a future meeting. Um, municipal parking, that's probably not ready yet. Yep. Okay. Um, what do you want to consider the following? Okay, there's a bunch of veterans, veterans uh, abatements. Yeah, we forwarded this to the uh, principal assessor and the board of assessors for their comments, and the board will act after hearing back from the Board of Assessors and Principal Assessors. Okay, so we'll wait, we'll wait for that information as well. Okay, and short-term rentals. There were two, a bylaw about short-term rental operators and also um, a community impact fee. 
Do the order says no to that one. We we said no to those. Okay. That was no. And this is coming back from assessors. Okay. Report. All right. So I, th I think that's it, isn't it? Okay. I, that, that's, I hit it off. The, the other ones are recurring articles and yep. in this report, so nothing new. Did. Nothing new. Nothing new. Okay. 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 Um, will, will the board at some point be discussing any of the citizen petitions or anything, or is there no, or do we not need to weigh in on those? Um, pretty good. We are now assembling the warrant. Okay. The board will be approving the warrant at its next meeting. Uh -huh. And then thereafter, we'll start developing motions. Okay. And when we have motions, the board can then start taking positions. Okay. All right. Um, all right. So that's all we need to do right now on town meeting articles. Um, town managers report, Mr. Kamalo, is there anything, anything new? <laughs> No further reports tonight. No further reports. Are there any liaison reports or board invites? I do. I have one from the uh, from the chamber. They would like to um, uh, present the um, chamber's new economic development committee. I, I think I brought it up the last uh, uh, my last meeting. They would wonder if they can come in the, the uh, our first meeting in April and just do a quick uh, overview of the stuff that they that uh, is important to them and introduce themselves. Okay. Anybody else? Nope. Um, just for board members, there is the five, five Town Board of Selectmen meeting is being held next Thursday, March 14th at 7 o'clock in Medway at the... The, 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 yes, one of those dissented. Oh, yeah, yeah, back from the, the main Senate. street. It's kind of an interesting thing. And members of the board are invited. Yeah, I think I, they're going I, to be. I, I sent back yes. Yeah, the they're discussing uh, department head compensation this mm -hmm. time, and they're always open to more items. It's kind of just a freewheeling, mm -hmm. uh, just open to discussion with others. Like it's kind of interesting sometimes to hear what other people are doing. So. Um, that Thursday night, I have open space and elementary school building committee. So. Okay. I am out of Just that. mentioning. Anybody's interested. Um, all right. I'll so, go. I would entertain a oh, board agenda items, future items. That's what I just did. What did you say? That's what I said, the, uh, April, uh, for, uh, for our April 9th for the chamber. For yes, the chamber. The chamber. Yeah. The chamber. Um, and, and I certainly think what Tim and Ben were both suggesting about at some point, just sit down and have a, have a broad discussion on the on the budget process and just the general municipal finance might might be helpful. I know you obviously had some thoughts, Ben, on what kind of things you might bring to that, and Tim mentioned it as well. I'd like to just um, have more chance to sort of explore some of this. I mm -hmm. think this was actually helpful tonight mm -hmm. for us all to mm -hmm. kind of understand how the pieces are put together. So um, a, sort of a financial budget just process discussion. All right, I'll entertain the motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Okay. All in favor, please say aye. 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 And of course, that aye, aye. unanimous. And we're not too far. Not bad. Yeah. 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 Ye